All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> going to mute all of you for right now, um, but feel free to unmute yourself if you need to, um, but do and use that chat if you have questions, comments, uh, any feedback or anything as well. But I just want to keep us on time and get us started. All right, so thanks so much to all of you for joining us for our biennial Parsons Field Institute update. I'm thrilled that all of you are here. This is actually a really exciting year for the Conservancy. It is our 30th anniversary, so 30 years of protecting natural open spaces and connecting people to the land. Many of you know me, but for those of you who might not, I'm Tiffany Sprague. I am the Parsons Field Institute Manager with the Conservancy. Uh, so I help oversee the scientific work that we do. So just a couple of quick housekeeping things. I can get my computer to function, of course. There we go. Um, so hopefully all of you know where the restrooms are. If you don't, I encourage you to become acquainted with that. Usually we do this event in person and we have refreshments, but today you're just going to have to imagine that you have that plate of cookies and uh, the glass of lemonade next to you. So this is a three and a half hour event. Uh, it's kind of a long time, but it is broken up into two segments with a break in the middle. So we'll have a half an hour break from 2.30 to 3. The first part mm -hmm. will discussing our long-term monitoring projects for plants and animals. And then in the second part, we'll be focused more on the management side of the work that we do. <clears throat> so again, I encourage you, please stay muted during the presentations. I'll uh, just to make this go a little bit smoother, but we are going to have a Q&A session following each of the main presentations, time willing. And you're welcome to put questions into the chat box and then I'll be moderating. So I'll read those out so that the presenters can answer them. Also feel free to use the chat for any general questions, feedback, anything like that as well. If you have a really complicated question that you don't want to put into the chat during that Q&A section, you are encouraged to unmute yourself to ask that, but do try to use that chat as much as you can just so we keep things moving along. So we have a pretty diverse audience out there today. Many of you are really familiar with the Conservancy, but I know that we have some people out there who might not be. So I wanted to give just a quick overview of who we are and what we do. So this is our mission statement for McDowell's Northern Conservancy. We are interested in protecting natural open spaces and connecting people to the land. And we do that through our three main pillars, so science, education, and stewardship. We are very much a volunteer driven organization. We have more than 160 volunteers, we call them stewards, and they engage with us through nine different programs. So this includes things such as engaging with visitors at the trailheads, we're out on the trails, uh, construction and maintenance to keep our trails in good working order, getting out there in the community to work with people and educate youth and adults. And the one that we're going to focus on today and that we're going to hear a presentation about in just a couple of minutes is our citizen science program. So most of the work that we do is in McDowell Sonoran Preserve right here in our backyard. It is the largest urban preserve in North America at 30,580 acres. It's actually the fourth largest urban preserve in the world. And so we're really lucky to have it here in our backyard. It makes up about a third of the land area of the city of Scottsdale. And so the preserve is owned by the city of Scottsdale, but it's managed through this unique partnership between the Conservancy and the city. And it's also heavily used for recreation. It sees more than a hundred, or sorry, more than a million visitations every year. These are people getting out there to enjoy the more than 225 miles of trails. Uh, they use them for non-motorized uses, so hiking, mountain biking, and horse riding. So the Parsons Field Institute is the science or the research arm of the Conservancy. And our mission statement is shown there for you. But basically we are looking to inform natural resource management of the Sonoran Desert and other arid lands. And we do that by partnering with other organizations and entities, as well as by engaging people as citizen scientists in our work. In addition, we are looking to use the information that we are gathering to contribute to the broader scientific community. And by engaging people and educating them about what we are doing, we are also hoping to inspire people to become stewards of our beloved desert. So in terms of partnerships, we have quite a few. Hopefully I got most of the science ones up here. I apologize if I missed any though. But by partnering with other organizations and with individuals, we are able to maximize our impact. We are able to learn and grow together, develop really good projects, and make sure that we are getting information out to everybody who needs it. 
then of course the other part of this is citizen science and within our citizen science program we have hundreds of people who volunteer their time and contribute thousands of hours every single year and our citizen science program is a little bit different from many of the other programs that other organizations have we encourage our people to be engaged from beginning to end uh, so they can get engaged at the very beginning coming up with ideas of projects uh, carry that forward through design and implementation and all the way through to analyzing and reporting out the results. So our work factors into three primary priorities. This is a really texty slide that I'm going to show you. I apologize for that. But the first of our research priorities is we are interested in assessing the impact of urban stressors and climate change on arid lands, including the preserve and on the Sonoran Desert. Our second priority is we are interested in determining the most effective ways to manage the Sonoran Desert and other arid lands to protect them into the future. And then the final one is the culmination of those first two and using the knowledge that we gain from those first two priorities so that we can actually then put it into action. So this is taking what we learn so that we can actually manage and conserve these lands. So with that, I wanna move into today's program. We are going to get an overview of some of our key projects. Uh, and these are going to be delivered by our stewards, as well as by staff and by some of our partners. And so for this first section, we're going to learn about priority one projects. So those are those long term monitoring projects for flora and fauna to understand how urban stressors and climate change are influencing resources. And then the second <coughs> part is going to focus on priorities two and three, and that is geared towards more of the management side of the work that we do. But now I am going to stop sharing my screen, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to John Zekius, who is the chair of the Citizen Science Program. He has been with the Conservancy for only a couple of years, but he immediately started to step into leadership roles, and we were lucky enough to snap him up so that he could be part of the Citizen Science Program. He was assistant chair for a year and then just stepped into the chair role this past April 1st. And so with that, I turn it over to John. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our Parsons Field Institute update. As Tiffany mentioned, I'm John Zekius. I'm a lead steward, a certified citizen scientist, and current chair of the Citizen Science Program for the Scottsdale McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. My presentation will provide an update on our program, projects, challenges, accomplishments over the past two years. The mission of the Citizen Science Program, we work with the Parsons Field Institute. Sorry, jumped ahead. Not good already. Field Institute to engage stewards as citizen scientists <clears throat> to conduct ecological research, to inform long-term natural resource management and inspire stewardship of the desert. Our team is made up of steward volunteer leaders. They manage projects in collaboration with the Parsons Field Institute. These certified citizen scientists bring varied knowledge and backgrounds and a passion for the project they manage to better understand the various impacts on flora and fauna in the preserve. Our team works with the leadership team of the Parsons Field Institute, who you'll hear from today. You've already heard from Tiffany. You'll also hear from Dr. Helen Rowe, who's the Associate Director, and Mary Fastigi, who's a Parsons Field Institute lead. Over the past two years, since our last update, Debbie Lagenfeld completed her term as Citizen Science Chair and was replaced by Paul Staker. Paul continued to drive projects, testing, and reporting of results. In addition, Paul has been a driving force in our invasive non-native plant efforts. I was named assistant chair in February of last year, as Tiffany mentioned, and accepted the chair role on April 1st of this year. The big news is we have so much going on. We've worked on over 16 projects over the last year. And even with the shutdowns due to COVID-19, we had over 190 citizen scientists volunteers log over 5,900 hours, and that's just in the last year. All things considered, this was an outstanding effort by stewards and the Parsons Field Institute staff. We have all felt the impact of COVID-19 shutdowns and they affected a lot of our programs last year. However, we were able to utilize trained stewards in smaller groups with health and safety, the most important consideration. 
With all of this in mind, we were able to accomplish all of our monitoring projects and we completed them on time. One of our challenges going forward is re-engaging stewards that did not feel safe or for various reasons, unable to participate in many of the projects this year. Also bringing in and training new stewards because we've had no stewardship 101 training or citizen science training for over a year. The good news is we have a significant pipeline of volunteers that are eager to join our efforts over the coming year. One of the big challenges we faced last year was the drought. As many of you know, the past summer of 2020 and this past winter of 2021 have had unusually dry conditions, which had an impact on a number of our projects from invasive non-native plant work, our restoration work, bird counts, butterfly counts, and our phenology study, just to name a few. However, in the winter of 2020, before the weather turned hot and dry, many of our projects were delayed due to the number of days and amount of rainfall we had that winter. Even in 2021, although a dry winter, when we worked at Brown's Ranch, recording our plots for our invasive non-native plant research, we had a little bit of snow, rain, and wind on our first day in the field but this didn't stop the team from completing their work. One of the key accomplishments over the last few years was the ability to hire Mary Fistigi. In September, 2019, Mary joined the Parsons Field Institute where she loves to support ecological research and citizen science within the preserve and greater Valley region. Mary received her bachelor's degree in environmental studies and history at the University of Michigan. Both as a student and after graduating, Mary worked as an outdoor environmental educator, teaching students from kindergarten through college undergraduates about ecology and the connections between society and nature. In 2017, Mary moved to Arizona for a fellowship at ASU, where she earned her master's of science degree from the School of Sustainability. Mary loves the Sonoran Desert and is passionate about conservation environmental, and environmental outreach. You know, an interesting fact about Mary is she may never have gotten involved in science if she hadn't once been stung by a bee. I'll let her fill you in on the details of that. Mary has been providing support on all our projects with a primary focus on degraded lands mapping, RestoreNet, and expanding our Central Arizona Conservation Alliance involvement, including leading project for desert defenders and our regional restoration efforts. Over the past two years, our monitoring projects have identified 20 new species within the preserve. We've identified five bird species, such as Savannah Sparrow, Greater Yellowlegs, and during a recent bird survey in April, the Swainson Hawk. We've identified five new invertebrates, such as the white belted ringtail dragonfly, the wandering gilder, and the pale faced club skimmer. Also, nine mammals, notably the free tail bat pallid bat, and ringtail, and three new plant species, including desert bells and prickly golden fleece, which is non-native. In my presentation that will be available after the meeting and online, I've put together a list of all the 22 species that we have found in the preserve over the past two years. Many of our projects monitor flora and fauna in the preserve. While some projects are ongoing, we've had some changes to current projects and several new projects. For our pollinators program, pollinators, excuse me, were added to our phenology study, as well as several new plants. We paused our corridor camera study this past year to evaluate new equipment to more efficiently identify medium to large mammals within the preserve. Our arthropod project continues and has faced some challenges with the dry weather but we continue to, to capture arthropods twice a year to better understand the impact of urbanization on the species. Amphibians is another species that was impacted by the very dry weather as they only appear several, usually once a year after the summer rains, which really didn't come last year. Some other studies that are ongoing are butterflies, birds, our bat study, which you'll hear more about and some exciting things about some new equipment, as well as our new project, the tortoise telemetry project, where we have current, we started working on this this spring and have now tagged nine tortoises 
to understand their movement through, through the preserve and the impact of urbanization on this very sensitive species. Debbie and Jane will discuss a couple of projects and our ongoing work and research to harvest and replace important soil crust in the preserve. In addition, they'll also discuss our efforts around testing of different restoration treatments, including rest our RestoreNet project in collaboration with the US Geological Survey and others. This is a picture of our Granite Mountain site where we have several treatments that we're testing. Mary and Dan will speak to our efforts regarding degraded lands and the findings from our unique approach using Google Earth, which we then validated in the field. Not only did we develop a process and mapping in the preserve, but also collaborated with others in the region to assist them in their efforts in identifying and mapping degraded lands. For our invasive non-native plant project, we continue our, our efforts to map, monitor, and remove invasive non-native plants in the preserve. Paul will speak to the use of the collector app and how it has enhanced our efforts to monitor and map invasive species in the preserve. The good news is we have trained over 50 stewards to help us map invasive non-native plants and have now surveyed over 30% of the preserved land mass. In addition to our efforts to treat and remove non-native plants in the preserve, which has led to six stewards completing training and testing to become herbicide applicators. The team have been actively working in the preserve since January 2020. This effort has led to more than 60 acres being treated. Our challenge is that must, much of the fountain grass and buffer glass we have treated with herbicide are in remote locations in the preserve, making this effort quite difficult, but we're after it. Another key accomplishment for our team is not only completing the testing and compiling of results from our projects, but then developing research papers and submitting for review, peer review prior to publication. Some examples are a past restoration paper was published in American Midland Naturalist. Also two other papers, Degraded Lands Mapping Methods, which is under revision for restoration ecology, and our closed trailed restoration study has been submitted to restoration ecology for review. This is a great accomplishment for the Parsons Field Institute and our stewards as we gain local and national recognition for our scientific research and project management efforts. Dan and Helen will discuss our efforts working with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Our team has developed new processes and protocols that you will hear more about, including working with regional, national, and international groups to monitor flora that have the potential to become endangered. This will allow us to take action and reverse the course of this devastation. We've completed a great deal of research to better understand the impacts of everyday life on the preserve and the larger Sonoran Desert, and are working to share this with local and regional partners so that others can learn from our research and many of our research techniques. Our amazing PFI staff and stewards have accomplished so much over the last two years, but we still have so much more to do. This picture here shows something that most of you have probably never seen. It's blue fountain grass. When we treat fountain grass with an herbicide, we use a blue coloring. By the way, this is my favorite color of, of fountain grass, blue. Because before, before it turns brown and dies, it's blue. So I thank you today for your, for your participation. And I'd like to turn it back over to Tiffany. All right, thanks so much, John, that was great. Um, so now I am very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Helen Rowe. She is the Associate Director of the Parsons Field Institute, has been involved with the Conservancy for about eight years now. She actually started as a volunteer with us. Uh, she was a research partner and a member of our Science Advisory Committee, and then she started working with the Conservancy for about six years. Um, she's a restoration ecologist and helps oversee a lot of the work that we do, but today she is going to give us a little bit of background about our long-term monitoring projects before we jump into those presentations. And Helen, you are muted. There. Yeah. And then here. Sorry. Okay. All right.
right. Yes, I got it all ready. Um, great to see um, so many people tuned in. Um, and um, I've got a short time, so I'm going to move right into it. So as Tiffany indicated, we have um, three research priorities. And my job uh, today uh, at this session is to, uh, talk, to sort of introduce our first research priority and tell you a little bit more background about why uh, we focus on this priority. Um, as you may know, um, we are facing uh, uh, devastating global biodiversity loss. Um, a seminal study in 2015 showed that worldwide, across all species groups of plants and animals, biodiversity is, is decreasing. And so we're experiencing unprecedented and catastrophic loss of biodiversity, which is largely driven by human um, impacts. Causes of decline uh, to include habitat degradation uh, and uh, habitat loss, uh, pollution, exploitation, and invasive species. And these uh, are uh, exacerbated by climate change. And we do not know right now the extent to which uh, these climate change impacts are going to uh, increase biodiversity declines as we get more into experiencing some of the climate change impacts. One of the things that we can do, uh, important things globally, is to set aside large contiguous spaces um, of, of open space. And uh, the preserve is an important piece of that. So not the preserve provides a Connects connection between uh, the McDowell Mountains and Tonto National Forest to the north. And because of that, um, supports uh, so many uh, species. Um, because uh, species need uh, this uh, large space um, in, in order to persist and thrive. The preserve uh, supports over a thousand uh, species. Um, and so in, you know, in our drive to protect biodiversity, it's not enough to just protect places. We also need to ensure that those places support can continue to support biodiversity. And so we need to continue to um, protect uh, and possibly restore and conserve as we'll talk about in uh, section two today. And so we need to uh, monitor these species um, over time and ensure that they have, they um, are able to continue to thrive. And so one of the um, elements of the preserve that's also important to note is that it's highly affected by urbanization, both by roads and uh, increased uh, human use of the preserve through recreation. And so through our monitoring programs, it's important to study the impact of those stressors on plants and animals in the preserve. We also, uh, key to our program is engagement of stewards in studying these effects through citizen science and also uh, being able to uh, share those, uh, what we're learning with the public. So one of the ways that we um, are able to protect the preserve, as I've said, is through uh, long-term monitoring. And so to do that, we need to understand 
what resources we have in the preserve. And we have a lot of that work, uh, a really solid foundation of that through our flora and fauna uh, work of understanding the different species in the preserve. And we continually update that. In fact, we just, um, as John had mentioned, we've, we continue to find new species um, in the preserve when we add those to our list. Uh, but we also need to look at what are the changes in those populations over time. And so we want to be able to quantify that change and then determine change it causes and then identify management actions and work with the city of Scottsdale to locally to be able to implement um, management uh, ch changes that are needed. And so some of our long-term monitoring projects include amphibians, arthropods, bats, birds, butterflies, plant phenology, and our IUCN plant assessments. Many of these uh, species or species groups not only help us to track uh, the trends of those particular species, but they're also sensitive to particular disturbances and, and can indicate broader changes that may affect, um, be affecting other species as well. So they're indicators or bioindicators. So for example, amphibians are important for detecting pollution and also drought. Um, birds for uh, habitat change, they're sensitive to their um, high quality habitats. Butterflies for climate change and environmental change. And so to sum up this, um, this priority, what we do is we monitor biodiversity local because after all, all biodiversity data is local. And we, um, so we monitor and then we, so that we can detect change and inform effective uh, biodiversity protection and conservation. We compare our data with other data sets in the region so that we can understand the larger picture and not just in isolation, since species move and populations are connected. Initiatives like ours are critical on the global scale for larger analyses and assessments of biodiversity trends that can help inform global biodiversity framework and IPIS, which is an intergovernment science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And so I like to think that um, what we're doing on a local scale can feed um, all the way um, to a global scale. Oops. And now I'd like to um, move into our presentations. And so in this section, we're going to be covering bats, butterflies, arthropods, and you'll see me back for the IUCN assessments. So I will stop sharing my screen and let Tiffany introduce our next speaker. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, so with that, we are going to roll into the actual presentations. And leading those off, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Debbie Langenfeld, who many of you know. She has been a steward for six years. Um, she's been involved in pretty much all of our citizen science projects, and she's held a number of leadership positions within the program. As John, said, as John said, she was the citizen science chair for three years. And once she moved off as citizen science chair, she immediately jumped into a couple of other leadership roles. Uh, one of those is as our BAT project lead, and that is the project that she's going to tell us about now. So, thank you, Tiffany. That was a nice introduction. I am, as Tiffany said, the citizen science lead for this project, working with Helen Tiffany and our research partner, Dr. Marianne Moore from ASU. Marianne couldn't join us today, but she's been instrumental in providing the knowledge and support needed to achieve our joint goals. So why are we studying bats? One of the most un misunderstood animals, bats are crucial to our planet. They provide essential pest control, pollinate our plants, and disperse seeds for new plants and trees to grow. 
that can also be important environmental indicators for climate change and urbanization because of their sensitivity to roof temperatures and their need for large insect populations. And unfortunately, like a lot of other species, many bat species are in serious decline. Global threats include loss of habitat, noise, light, and intentional disturbance by humans. If, and if that isn't enough, there is a fungal infection known as white nose syndrome that affects hibernating bats and has killed millions of them in the eastern U.S. And it's moving west and has been detected in California, Texas, and Washington. And very sadly, it was just announced last week in, as being detected in New Mexico as well. So where is our research area? Well, there are several closed mines in the preserve, and we're monitoring one that is known to support bat population. It offers the water, consistent temperature, and humidity that bats prefer. The surrounding riparian area offers an abundance of insects for foraging and a commuting corridor. We've known bats were there since 1981, when the BLM and game hunters periodically conducted emergence counts and captures at the site. And in 1992, the mine was determined to be used as a maternity quality for towns and visited bats. That was an important find because the towns were considered a sensitive species in Arizona. In 2000, the Nature Conservancy declared the area an important conservation area for three species of bats, the lesser longnose, California leafnose, and K. myotis. And it's in a good location to contribute to research being done across the country and Arizona to detect the presence of white nose syndrome. To achieve our research goal of assessing the bat species occurrence and relative abundance across seasons and years, we have to combine methods. So we do emergence counts, physical captures, and acoustic recording. Reviewing the chart, we can determine relatively how many bats are there and when with emergence counts and acoustics, but not with captures. We can determine what species are there with acoustics and captures, but not with emergence counts. Taken together, we have a comprehensive approach that includes both the mine and surrounding area. So let's now delve into each of these methods a little further. We've been doing spot checks in the area since 2016, but in 2019, we began more rigorous emergence counts to determine when bats use the mine and seasonal changes in population size. Emergence counts are done once a month, as close to the new moon or darkest night of the month as possible. We position two IR infrared lights and two video cameras in front of the mine and record for two and a half hours. We then visually count the number of bats coming out of the mine and going into the mine. With two years of data, that means that fellow citizen scientist John Griffin and I have reviewed over 230 hours of videos. The following video will give you a good idea of what we're looking at. Watch closely, and you'll see a bat entering the mine. We count that as one in. Keep watching, and you'll see a bat exiting the mine. We count that as one out. Now, you might say that that was the same bat, and we're double counting. But do you really know for sure that that was the same bat? That's why we're calling it relative abundance instead of absolute abundance. Because we could be observing the same bat in and out, or it could be different bat. Moving on to captures, they answer the question of which species are there and possibly why they are there. We've done a few occasional captures of bats entering and leaving the mine using the harp trap in the picture on the right. It's rightly named because it looks like a harp with three rows of fishing line and a trot. The bats aren't harmed. They're caught in the lines as they fly either into or out of the mine and slide into the trough where we pick them up. And then, um, as you can see from Marianne Moore, she's identifying the bat species, checking its general health, measuring, weighing, and determining the sex. She's also looking to see if the bat is pregnant and lactating. A swab is taken to test for the occurrence of white nose syndrome. 
Acoustic monitoring allows us to determine what species occur within the surrounding area and assess how their distribution might change over time. We do this monitoring on the same day and for the same amount of time as the emergence count. Ultrasonic calls of bats in the area are collected by a specially designed recording device placed high in the air. Some of the equipment that John actually mentioned, um, John mentioned we were getting some new equipment. That's part of it. The files that are created are then analyzed by software that is also specifically designed to evaluate the wave pattern and auto ID species. Not all species can be auto ID though. Those that can't must be manually analyzed, and that's because they could, there could be noise interference, multiple overlapping bat calls, or bats without calls, uh, bats whose calls sound very much alike. I thought it would be interesting for you to see the output from the process. Here are two bat call spectrograms. Bats, for, bats have different calls depending on what they're doing. The bottom is a low frequency commuting call. This bat is cruising around the neighborhood checking out the scenery. The top is a higher frequency, very rapid staccato call. The bat is acquiring and capturing an insect, much like a fighter pilot would be doing to zero in on a target. This is a spectrogram of a canyon bat produced from a recent field day. The species was auto id using a software program called Sonabat, which is also new equipment we new software we purchased. You can see how crisp this recording is and easily recognized by the software. You might be familiar with this bat because it's the first one to come out at night right after sunset. It's probably obvious, but this is a spectrogram that could not be auto id and will have to be evaluated manually. Well, I've shown you our three research techniques, but what does it all mean? Although we're just starting to get to understand the data, the next few slides review some of our preliminary results. To answer our first question, which species are there, we can take a look at the number of acoustic calls recorded by species. Each pie chart represents a year of data. This is not all the species that were identified. It's the calculated percentage of the bats with recorded calls greater than 100. The canyon bat is overwhelmingly the most recorded species. This is not surprising as they are second to the most abundant in the Phoenix area behind the Mexican or Brazilian free tail bat. We can further answer the question which species are there by looking at the capture data. We've captured four species, including predominantly the Townsend Big Ears, rightfully named for the Big Ears, I'd say. The canyon, the California myotis, and the cave my uh, and the cave myotis. And since we're talking about captures, we might as well report our very important find in June 2019. As you can see from the fireworks, we were elated to confirm that the mine is still nearly 30 years, nearly after 30 years, being used as a maternity roost for towns and big big bats. Not only are they important species, but they're a species that is highly susceptible to human disturbance and specific in their roosting requirements. And to answer the question relatively, how many are there and when are they there, we can look at emergence and acoustic data over time. The graph on the left is the average out count for the mine over two years. It shows that the mine is used heavily in the late spring, early summer months. Based on the capture and historical data, we can assume that the bats are mostly towns and bigger bats, and that's when they're using the mine as an eternity roost. The graph on the right represents the total calls for the four capture species over two years. It also shows heavier use in the late spring, early summer months. Both graphs show that the mine and surrounding area are used year-round, which has important implications for when certain activities can occur in that area. In the future, we will have enough data to uncover patterns and trends, such as the effects of weather. So where do we go from here? Of course, we'll continue with the monthly monitoring at the mine. But we want to expand our research to understand how bouts are using other areas of the preserve. So next week, we're deploying five more acoustic monitoring devices. 
in order to get the broadest sample, they'll be deployed across different biotic communities, communities at different elevations and terrain. We're excited to be working with the national uh, with the North America Bat Monitoring Program on this effort, and we'll be contributing our data to help them reach their goal of creating a continent-wide bat monitoring program to promote effective conservation decision making and long term viability of that population. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, are there any questions? All right, thanks so much, Debbie. So far, people are taking it really easy on you and there are no questions in the chat. Uh, I do encourage folks to get some questions in there. Gonna, oh, goodness. So Scott just popped something in there. It's not a question directed toward Debbie, but he did want to say they wanted to thank the Field Institute for their efforts in all of the long-term monitoring projects. Um, he can't overstate how valuable it is to be able to follow trends relative to the context of the urban interface, the gooseneck connector, the surrounding development, and climate change. Long-term data sets of such op optimal study areas are extremely rare. And as Helen mentioned, this really does have the potential for global implications on conservation focus areas, such as wildlife connectivity. I have a question for Debbie. Yes. This is, this is Patty. I just was wondering, um, have, is there any link to um, disease from the bats that we have in the Sonoran Desert? I know that there was a big deal um, in Asia about the bats and they've, it seemed like they got a really bad rap. And I was just wondering if that's something that is, is there some truth to, to that? And, or do we have anything like that in, with our bats in the desert? You know, uh, hi Patty, first of all. Um, I don't know the answer to that. And I wish Marianne Moore was here because she was one of the very first people who went in and discovered uh, the white nose syndrome back east. And her research is on white nose syndrome, but I don't, and she also teaches, um, uh, does a lot of teaching about what is what happened with COVID. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that. Tiffany, do you know? Unfortunately, I missed a little bit of the question. I apologize, Patty, I was uh, checking out the chat. But you're wondering, is it related to the novel coronavirus and the disease issues surrounding that? Yeah, that or, um, I'm trying to think about five years ago, there was something in Asia about the disease with the bats, or maybe it wasn't even that long ago, maybe it was three or four years ago before the coronavirus, but I was just wondering, and what, what, okay, what is the white nose syndrome caused from? So I'll start with the second one. The white nose syndrome is caused by a fungus. Um, don't ask me to pronounce what fungus it is. Uh, it's got a very, very long name, but it's caused by a fungus. Um, Debbie has it up here, pseudogeogenome, yeah, whatever, just start things. <laughs> um, <laughs> And basically affects hibernating bats uh, and it destroys their tissues. Um, and so you can see it on the bats in this picture. Yeah. Um, and it also, it affects hibernating bats. It makes them kind of restless as they're hibernating. And so what that does is it actually uses a lot of the important energy reserves. And so they ended up running out of energy before they're able to emerge from hibernation. And so they can die during hibernation or when they emerge, just be weakened to the point that they then cannot survive. Um, with reference to your first question, there's a lot of cases of human wildlife conflict that involve disease. Um, some of them are due to things that humans are doing and um, intentionally interacting with bats in ways that they shouldn't or with other wildlife. Others are just things that we cannot necessarily control. And so there's a lot of information out there um, from disease centers and from biologists who are studying the, these diseases about ways that we can minimize that and um, ways that we can move forward from them. I am not one of those people who knows a lot about that, but I'd be happy to help you get more information about it. Oh, that's okay. I just was curious about that. All right. Thank you. Yes, we've got just a couple of minutes. Debbie, you did get some questions. So one of them is why are bats counted from half an hour before sunset to two hours after sunset? 
Um, for our research, actually, um, at the mine, we count them for two and a half hours. So we, we count them half an hour before and then for two hours after. Um, but be, they're counted before because some bats actually start coming out, um, like the counting bat, for example, right at or right after sunset. So some bats actually do come out before sunset and they're returning. Uh, they're, so they're going out to forage and they are then returning uh, in the early dawn hours of the morning. So that's why we count them until half an hour after sunset, or we will be when we put out the five monitors. Debbie? Yes. Ernie Finkel, how are you? Hi, uh, I'm good. How are you? Great. Uh, just a quick question uh, on the bat counts. Yep. In the preserve, we use laser, laser counts to, to basically uh, cover people coming people in. Coming in. And actually, we must have some sort of an algorithm of those who do not return to the trail and go on to some other uh, part where they will leave. Do you have an algorithm on the, the bat counts as they come in? Because there's no way to really ascertain who, which bat is which when they go in and which when they go out. So is there any way that you, any formula used to sort of measure that count? Other, uh, there isn't, uh, if I understand your question right, there isn't. It is just a simple count of the bats that uh, enter, that break the line of the gate, and that exit. But there isn't an algorithm that helps us determine, uh, if I understand your question, what percentage of those uh, we've double counted or something. Is that your question? That, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. that was my question. No, uh, there, there is not. I have one more question, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering, does the light, um, our city lights, are they affecting the bats or ha have you guys noticed that? We don't have the data to support that. Uh, as I said, we, we do do, you know, we do do the research on the, as close to the darkest night uh, as possible. But um, I, we do not have the data yet um, to support that. And then Tiffany, I don't know if, if you're aware of any data that supports that. There is information out there um, about light effects on bats. And for many bat species, they react negatively to it and um, their numbers decrease in that area. Other bat species actually benefit from it. So it's really on a species by species case. Well, I know that, you know, the bats in my neighborhood, for example, um, are drawn toward the light because that's where they, the insects are, for example. So I guess it probably does depend a little bit on the bat. So we have more questions and comments rolling in. Um, we actually need to move along, but hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end of this section before the break so that we can get the rest of the questions answered. So thanks all of you for getting those questions in. Well, thank you all. I enjoyed presenting my bat research to you. Thank you, Debbie. All right, so we are going to move on now to butterflies and I'm going to introduce you to Ron Rutowski, who is one of our research partners. He's actually been a partner with the Parsons Field Institute since our very first project, which was to do a baseline inventory of flora and fauna in the preserve in 2011 through 2013. And he stuck around as a research partner for our butterfly work, and he also serves on our science advisory committee. So Ron works at or worked at ASU and the School of Life Sciences for 40 years. And then even after retiring, he is still active in research and in teaching. Ron's work really focuses on bright coloration in animals. He's working to understand the function and the perception. And with that, he specializes in butterflies. So we're really, really pleased to have him be part of our work. And Ron, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Uh, it should be up there. Can you see it? It is not sharing. Oh, no, that's strange. It's technology. Hang on, just a second. Here. Yeah, just a moment, please. Ah. I had thought I had told it to share. Let's try this one more time. All 
All right. Okay. Yes. Good. Well, sorry about that little glitch. Um, hello, everybody. Good to, good to see and hear you all. Uh, today, my job is to uh, give a brief overview of the butterfly monitoring program that we have on the preserve. And uh, my intention is to first tell you something about the history and the rationale for the project, and then to tell you something a little, just overview a little bit, some of the protocol and procedures that we use in the project. And I want to show you some of the results that we've gotten over the last uh, seven or eight years. And, uh, and then finally, to talk a little bit about some broader implications with respect to how this connects or might be informed or inform some other regional studies of butterfly abundance and diversity. So as Tiffany uh, suggested, I first got involved with the preserve as part of the initial survey of the flora and fauna that was done in, two th in the years from 2011 to 2013. And of course, the end result of that was this report that came out on the flora and fauna of the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. And in that report, we listed 28 species of butterflies uh, that had been seen or identified on the preserve. Now, after this initial report, the, um, uh, the, the Conservancy, the Preserve, got very interested in establishing some monitoring programs so we could see how the flora and fauna were changing over longer periods of time. And butterflies became part of the overall monitoring program, which as we've heard today also includes monitoring programs for birds, bats, amphibians, plants, and uh, butterflies were chosen because they constitute a pretty good indicator taxon. First of all, they're conspicuous and easy to count, so it's not too difficult to get a bunch of people and go out and start counting butterflies. If you do this on a regular basis, you can get a sense of how the populations are growing or declining over time. Also, butterflies uh, rely heavily on the plant community, both for nectar sources and for larval food plants, and so, they are a good indication of sort of the health of the plant community as well. Another thing, and uh, I say this unabashedly, uh, butterflies are highly uh, charismatic organisms <laughs> that people really love and are interested in. So it hasn't, it's not too difficult to engage volunteers, stewards and others to participate in the, in, in the counts. And then lastly, uh, there is a nationwide, actually North America-wide uh, program of counts. It's been going on for, I think it's now 30 or 40 years. And this program is now administered by the North American Butterfly Association and has, a, and part of the program are, our contributors to the program are all of these spots shown, our counts done in all of these spots shown on the map. So there's about 450 sites in the US, Canada, and Northern Mexico where people go out counting butterflies uh, at least once a year. And these data are entered into the North American Butterfly Association's count uh, database and are being used for uh, research purposes to look at uh, seasonal trends in butterfly abundance and diversity, or I'm sorry, yearly long-term trends in butterfly abundance and diversity uh, throughout North America. So we thought we could establish, we could connect with that as well. And also uh, the North American Butterfly Association has a series of, uh, of protocols and guidelines that, that we could quickly plug into and follow. So we started the butterfly counts in 2014, 17 years ago. Initially, the counts were done just in the fall for the first three years or so in, uh, in late September. In 2017, it was decided just to get an even larger picture of uh, the butterfly abundance and diversity on the preserve. Uh, we would uh, establish a spring count. So that was done in, again in 2017. It's been running for about five years now. Um, the butterfly counts have been turned out to be a, a good community science thing. We have uh, not only local experts that are involved, there are steward leads and, and there are stewards that, uh, and other people who participate as well, including it's been, there's been students from Scottsdale Community Count, 
uh, college and other places. So uh, as a community science project, it's been good. The COUNT protocol has been, uh, we've developed that and it's been refined uh, in, the, uh, in the various reiterations of the COUNT. We now, I think, have quite a good uh, pro proce process in place, protocol in place. We have seven established routes that are well mapped out and uh, there are uh, guidelines for how to count, when to count, and all of that that I think are making the results very nicely repeatable and, and rigorous. The results themselves are held by the part, are held or curated by the Parson Field Institute and they're also, as I indicated, shared with the North American Butterfly Association's uh, database on butterfly counts. So I won't go into too much more detail about the, uh, the actual process of the count, but give you a sense of what the, some of the results and trends that we've seen look like. First of all, since that initial flora and fauna survey, we've added something on the order of, we basically doubled the number of species we've seen on the preserve. And uh, we have now counted over 7,000 individual butterflies over the uh, 12 counts that have been run on the preserve. The typical fall count, uh, well, and then there's these, these, this graph, these graphs, what you can see is the number of, you know, for example, the right hand, left hand one, the number of species plotted against the year in which the count was done. And I show at least for the last five years, uh, both the spring and the fall counts. And then, uh, so number of species is one of our metrics. Another is the number of individual butterflies observed on a count. And we, we see those numbers here. Uh, several things you can say about these numbers. First of all, the typical fall count yields about 20 species and about 500 individuals. Well, and the typical spring count uh, yields about the same number of species, about 20 species, although they're not necessarily the same uh, species that we see in the fall. There is some, are some seasonal patterns of butterfly uh, diversity on the preserve. And we typically in the spring see about 750 individuals or have seen about 750 individuals. So the spring seems to be a little more productive. One of the key things that you can see from these uh, graphs is there's a tremendous amount of year to year variation in abundance and diversity. So some of the counts that we've done, uh, frustrating as they've been, have been, have been uh, as low as 25 individual butterflies. You know, we've got seven places we sample and we only came up in some some counts with 25 individuals total. The full range is from 25 up to 2,000. And as you can see uh, that that 2,000 was in the uh, spring of 2019. And the diversity shows some, uh, also shows it's a lot of variation. Uh, some counts have been as low as five species. The highest number we've had has been 35. So there's a lot of variation here that uh, we're, we're still trying to understand. I'll get to that more a little later. Fall and spring counts, you can also see here, are not really correlated. So that, for example, in 2019 here, in terms of the number of species, there were about 35 species seen in the spring count, but only about 18 or so in the fall. And this is uh, the usual thing that the, the number of counts that we see, for example, in the spring doesn't predict well what we're going to see uh, that, that fall. I just wanted to show you this quickly. This just shows you the relative abundance on a given count of the difference of different species of butterflies. So this is this for the, this is a histogram of the abundance of uh, the 20 some odd species seen on the 2020 spring count. And so you can see that two of the species were uh, the spring azure and the checkered white were quite abundant with, a, with counts of uh, 160 or more for each of these species. There are others that were also seen in numbers that uh, go up in the tens of 20s or 30s or 40s, but there's a large number of species where you only see one or two individuals. And this is uh, very typical of the counts. It's, I won't go into our, uh, our, the reasons why this might be, but it's typical that on a given count, we have a few species, a half dozen, maybe a couple of more that are relatively numerous and a bunch that you hardly see any of. 
if we look for the fall counts at what species are abundant, we tend to find these six species uh, on almost all counts and in relatively good numbers. You can see that one of the most abundant butterflies that we see during the fall counts is this one, the uh, sleepy orange. It's the top dark blue line here. Oh. And, and you can see how its numbers vary, but it's generally one of the more numerous butterflies we see on counts. Um, other species are less common, but still more common than these ones where we see one or two. But many of them show much less year-to-year -year variation in their numbers in the fall count. So the, for example, the Empress Lelia, which is this butterfly down here, and which is the orange line running through the plot there, you're typically a hundred or less, but it's pretty consistent that they're they're out there in a few tens of uh, of individuals. The um, Mormon metal mark, which is up here on the the upper right, is also uh, one of these ones that's consistently out there, but often not in huge numbers, but in in notable numbers. So that's another sort of characteristic of the counts and suggests that some of the species, are, uh, are more variable than year, year to year than others and perhaps more sensitive some of the environmental variables that affect their numbers out there. So this sort of species-based uh, conclusions I think is gonna become increasingly important as we go on, go on here. I just wanted to point out too that uh, if we look across the sites and there are five sites that have been sampled in all of the fall counts, uh, Dixie Mine, 128th Street Tank, Tom's Thumb Canyon, Landslide Trail, Brown's Ranch, Road and Mountain. You can see that uh, there, is some very, they, there is some variation in a given year, like 2018 here. There's some variation in which area produced the greatest number of species. It's not always consistent, although it does appear that uh, Brown's Ranch and the Dick and the Tom Thumb Canyon are two of the sites that we visit that often produce the highest numbers of butterflies. Uh, Dixie Mine, 128th Street Tank, uh, fewer, but in some cases it's not the, the same species that you find in both cases. But in general, in, in a given year, the abundance and diversity is similar among sites and the ways in which it changes from year to year. Uh, appears also to be true across sites. So how does it, I, I could go on and on about these sorts of numbers and stuff, but it's an interesting question as to how does this connect with what we understand that's going on with butterflies more generally? Tiffany alluded, or I'm sorry, Helen alluded to the fact that arthropods are on decline worldwide and other organisms. And in fact, there's this paper that just came out a few, a couple of months ago um, from Matt Forrester and, and a group of co-authors. Matt Forrester is a conservation biologist who works with butterflies at the University of Nevada, Reno. And as you can see from the title, what they found is that um, community science programs or, or citizen science programs like our butterfly counts have been seeing fewer and fewer butterflies as uh, the American West tends to warm and dry. So again, they, they suggest that butterfly numbers have been declining across the entire West. They've used the NAVA database as one of the databases to support, the, to test this conclusion or come up with this result. And uh, they have found some pretty strong correlations between warming, higher temperatures and drying, lower precipitation as a, as a cause. I just, I'm, um, I'm maybe not happy to report, but I can report that uh, our results, even though they're from such a limited time period of seven years, are sort of falling in line with this. So here, what I've plotted is the number of species, one of our metrics, against the rainfall. These are for fall counts. So the number of species plotted against the rainfall during the summer preceding the fall count. And we get quite a, a significant positive correlation. That is, the more rainfall that we get in the monsoons, the more species we see on the uh, butterfly counts. Similar correlation for the number of individuals seen on the count. I will point out that uh, I, in the analysis I did, I threw out this data point because that was the one year when the snout butterflies had an, a huge population explosion. And I think of the 
thousand butterflies or so we observed, um, 800 of them were snouts. It was something like that. I can't remember, but uh, that was sort of a, a barren year and so wasn't really included in the analysis. But we get a very similar set of results for the spring counts, even though we only have five uh, five counts, spring counts that have been done so far for the number of species. If we look at how that's related to the winter rains, the rain that falls between October and March preceding the count in early April, we get again a, a significant positive correlation. Number of individuals, again, a significant positive correlation um, uh, in, in uh, how when, and how the number of individuals that's affected by winter rains. So in general, we're getting uh, results even on the short term that are consistent with this, uh, the, the results of this recent uh, uh, report on how butterfly numbers are changing in the West as apparently as a result of climate change. I will point out that the, they didn't use our data for the preserve because they didn't use any data set that was less than 10 years. And many of the data sets they use span 30 or 40 years or even more. So in summary then, I think the counts are proceeding well. The organization is going smoothly, largely thanks to the, uh, the steward leads that I've had the chance to work with during the course of the, uh, the butterfly account program. The data collection and summary is I think has gotten quite streamlined and uh, we have a great system for entering data into spreadsheets that we can use in the preserve and also for going to NABA. And there's been really good community involvement. We've had as many as, I mean, COVID brought the numbers of community participants down to about 15 per count, but we're uh, previous to that and hopefully in the future to come, we're up into, we've had as many as 30 to 50 people involved in the count, a given count. The implications are, I think, that it's too soon to detect long-term changes, so we need to stick at this, even though the numbers uh, have gone been low for the last few counts. Um, hopefully, they'll come up again, but it's important for us to quantitatively document this. The positive effects of rainfall on butterfly abundance and diversity on the on the um, um, on the preserve, I think, are pretty clear at this point. And the, the, this, these relationships will uh, allow us to anticipate what the effects of climate change might be on butterflies over as well, overall, as well as on specific species. So just to wrap it up, I wanna thank all the participants and I wanna especially thank the steward leads. Uh, I've, there've been six of them over the years, most recently Doug Jensen, but they've all just done a wonderful job of pulling this all together. So I'll, uh, take questions or comments now. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ron. Unfortunately, we are running low on time. Uh, too much great information there, but I do encourage people, you're welcome to still put questions in the chat uh, and we'll save them. We can address those either during the break or after everything is done. Um, but thanks so much, Ron. That was a great presentation. Mm -hmm. So now I am thrilled to introduce you to Derek Yui, who is our research partner up at NAU, who is helping us with our arthropod study. So from their flying cousins down to the ground dwelling variety. Derek is a PhD candidate at NAU. He's working with Dr. Hofstetter and his dissertation is on how seed harvesting ants help structure plant communities. Um, but his overall research focus is on how arthropod communities are structured through biotic and abiotic factors which factors very neatly into our goals as well. And so with that, Derek, if you want to share your screen. Cool, thank you for that introduction. Um, all right, one second. <laughs> there we go, hopefully everyone can see that. All right, yeah, thanks for having me today to talk about uh, some very neat work that's come out of the the Sonoran Preserve. Um, I'm up here in, in Flagstaff, but it, it's a pleasure to be working down there in the Sonoran where it's nice and warm. Um, and yeah, I'll be talking about uh, arthropod communities on the urban edge of the preserve today. So uh, we, we've been sampling these ground-dwelling arthropod communities. And what are ground-dwelling arthropods? They're, they're arthropods that live on the ground surface. These can be things like ants and beetles, mites. Um, it's a whole large diversity. And um, 
these uh, ground dwelling arthropods are really defined by mostly living on the ground surface and it's whatever falls into a pit trap. And, uh, and a pit trap is essentially a cup dug to ground level um, and a very easy way to sample um, ground dwelling arthropods. And this community of ground dwelling arthropods is really important for all sorts of ecosystem services like trophic regulation of other groups. Many of these are, are predators or herbivores. Um, many ground dwelling arthropods are important for decomposition and nutrient cycling. Um, and they're really important for linking those above ground processes to below ground processes. And you think of things like ants that um, while they live on the surface most of the time, they also nest and they dig down below the surface. So they really form this link um, of above ground and below ground processes. And, and uh, really the, a huge defining characteristic of ground dwelling arthropod communities is that there's this enormous diversity that is found in them. Um, we're talking things like insects, arachnids, even some land crustaceans like isopods um, and then things that used to be insects, but now are in their own group, uh, springtails. So um, there's just this huge diversity in that, uh, you know, we've seen some great talks uh, on bats and, and butterflies, but, you know, that's just a that tiny percent of the diversity that's actually there in the Sonoran Preserve. Most of it is going to be in your ground dwelling arthropods. Um, there's just so many species and so much is unknown about a lot of these, these species. So um, it's really interesting that we have this data um, that's come from the preserve to be able to look at this. Um, and many of you know, the McDowell Sonoran Preserve is this unique urban interface environment um, where water and temperature stress is pretty extreme compared to other areas. Uh, so I was really excited to be able to, to look at some of this data because um, a lot of arthropod community data um, is actually comes from, from wetter places uh, and more mild climates. And so this extreme climate that uh, we have down in Phoenix um, is really interesting um, to look at some of these questions with. So uh, this previous study that's, uh, that's come out of the CAP project um, found that urban areas in Phoenix have more arthropod abundance. There's more total numbers, but the diversity is less. And that was just comparing urban areas, so like someone's backyard, to the desert, to, to pristine areas. But here we have a different question. We're actually going to look at the urban interface. And so our study objectives for this were to compare uh, arthropod communities on the urban edge, right, where that development, um, you can see there's houses in this picture, right, um, versus the interior of the preserve. Uh, and we also wanted to examine the effects of temperature and precipitation on these ground-dwelling arthropod communities of the Sonoran Desert. So you may be familiar with this idea of an urban edge and how it affects different communities. So uh, a classic example um, is mammals, right? Uh, uh, deer or, or mountain lions or whatever um, are highly affected by this urban uh, edge. It can really change their habitat because even though the plants might look pretty similar, you know, here versus inside the preserve, um, the effect of the houses being there changes their behavior, right? Um, so the, these urban edges can really impact the ecology of systems and make them uh, quite different from the interior of the preserve. So we were wondering um, if this extends to the ground dwelling arthropod community. Now I was able to jump on this project um, it, to look at the da uh, data and analyze it, but this has uh, been happening all the way since 2012, back when I was an undergrad. This was way before um, I was actually in graduate school. So this is a great data set. There's so few data sets that span this amount of time for arthropods. And basically this is the only one I know of that spans this amount of time in an arid environment like Phoenix. So this is a great data set that's been collected down here. Um, and what uh, was established are these interior and um, exterior site pairs. So you can see here um, we have an orange sites that are on the urban edge, very close to houses. And then 
in blue, we have interior sites that are at least a kilometer away from the urban edge interface. And so the, the thought is that these orange sites should be pretty impacted by the urban edge and the uh, blue sites should be more like control, more um, control sites that are, that are not impacted, that are on the interior of the preserve. And so this project was established with the Central Arizona Phoenix Long-Term Ecological Restoration, the, the CAP-LTR project um, in uh, coordination with ASU. Um, and again, that goal is to compare those urban edge communities um, with the interior communities. And um, we have a great range of sites. I do wanna point out that there are two sites here, Dixie Mine and Prospector that we consider both interior sites because there is no urban edge on this side. So these are kind of like a control pair. And I'll come up later in the presentation. But the other four pairs are all um, our proper interior exterior pairs. And this uh, project was, was great. It uses a lot of citizen scientists. Um, I got to go down there and go on one of the collection trips pre-COVID. Um, and it, I got to see all these sites in person. It was really great. Um, beautiful down there. I, lo I love the McDowell Sonoran Preserve, so it's so neat um, to be able to go experience it and see all these passionate um, citizen scientists out there helping collect the pit traps. And so at each site, um, we placed uh, pit traps out there, which are just the cups dug into the ground, and we opened them up for 48 hours. So uh, you, you open them on like a Friday and collect them on a Sunday. And you take anything that falls into those cups and you put it into a collection cup. Uh, that's what's happening right here. And then you have your sample. And then you go back to the lab and you identify anything that fell in there. Of course, that's easier said than done. Like I said, uh, these arthropods are so diverse. So just figuring out what, uh, which species you have is a huge problem for any uh, pit trap study like this for for ground dwelling arthropods. It's just so difficult to figure out um, what, what the uh, insect or arthropod you have is. There's so many options and a lot of these groups are very, um, are very much not defined well. It's very hard to key out your specimen and to figure out what you have. Um, some of them don't even have the work done on them. There's probably new species all over the place um, that fell into our traps, but uh, there's still, it'd be a huge amount of work to even figure that out, right? You'd have to partner with taxonomists and um, describe the new species. So um, I bet a lot of the mites that are down there are probably new species to science, um, which is pretty, pretty neat, but also poses a challenge if you're going to try and understand these community dynamics, because it's, uh, the identification level is all over the place. So we used uh, this uh, pretty common, commonly used uh, practice of going down to the lowest practical taxonomic unit. And that's just to say that um, most of the time we got down to the species level, but when we couldn't get down to the species level, sometimes we're at the genus sometime, uh, level, sometimes we're at family level or higher, depending on the group. So I'm gonna be talking about LPTUs in this presentation. But you can just kind of equivalent that to species level. Um, that's kind of what this means. Um, overall, over those uh, eight years of pit trapping, um, we collected 25,477 individuals and identified those to 287 unique LPTUs. So that's a lot of diversity and a lot of individuals. Um, and 74 of those LPTUs, and remember LPTUs kind of like species, are unique to a single site, and 40 of those are found at all sites, ubiquitous at all sites. And here we can see on the right, this pie chart just kind of shows you um, a breakdown of major groups, you know, what the Sonoran ground-dwelling arthropod community really looks like by the numbers. About 30% of individuals are mites, and about 30% are ants and 20% um, are springtails. So those are our three dominant groups, uh, mites, ants, and springtails. Um, we also have uh, pretty common are some beetles, true bugs in the order Hemiptera, spiders, and, and bristletails. And we had kind of this uh, others group of uh, things like isopods and, 
and um, oh, what else? There, there's a there's a few others that we lumped into this others group. This kind of gives you the spread of what this community looks like. And then, so seven minute timer. A seven minute timer. <laughs> That's eleven minutes. So that you have four minutes left. If you go four minutes, there's no time. Oh, four minutes. Okay, I'll try. I'll try and go quick then. Um, all right. So if we're we looked at the interior versus exterior site question, um, there's 44 of those LPTUs, those species that are unique to interior sites, and 48 that are unique to exterior, and 192 that are kind of shared. So there's actually a pretty big shared pool of species um, with only a few unique to interior or exterior sites. And here's just some of the cool little pictures of some of the, the arthropods we found down there, pretty cool. Um, so this was a neat finding. Um, we were looking, when you compare the interior versus exterior pair. So down here you can see the orange um, exterior site, the urban edge site paired with the interior, the green site. And what's happening in this graph is we're looking at the, the, the difference in diversity on, uh, between uh, the, the pairs of sites, the edge and the interior pairs. And this graph shows you um, A, the, the percent difference. So for example, Bell and Gateway, about 50% of their species are different when you go from the edge site to the interior site. Um, and you can see that, you know, that's it, all of our sites are between that 40 to about 55% difference going from the edge to the interior. Um, the other thing this graph shows is how they're different, right? Because if you take two sites, they can either be different because one species gets replaced by another site or by another species at another site, right? So um, you go from Bell and you have uh, an ant species A, and you go to Gateway, and it's replaced by ant species B. That's called turnover. That's a species turnover. Um, and then the other thing that can make sites look different is nestedness, when a species is lost. So you go at Bell, there's ant species A, and then you go to Gateway, and there's nothing. We just lost a species. And what, so that means one site is a smaller subset of another site. And so here, the dark, the dark bands represent the turnover and the light bands represent nestedness. So the takeaway message is that all, this is mainly driven by turnover. So when you go from the edge of the, the preserve to the interior, you're, we're seeing this replacement of species. So one species is being replaced by another. We're not losing species, which is good. Um, I'll try and go quick here because I know I don't have much time. So uh, the uh, other big finding was relationships with climate. And this is pretty standard, um, right? We have all these groups that share positive relationships with precipitation. Phoenix, dry place. Um, so obviously when there's more rain, there's gonna be more bugs and things like spiders, true bugs, beetles, bristle tails, these all have positive relationships with precipitation. Here on the right, we have this um, uh, 2D space of of community composition. So this is just a way to visualize uh, the arthropod communities. Each one of those circles or triangles represents one of our sites at one date. And so if they're close together, they're similar in their community composition, similar bugs. If they're far apart, they're different in their composition. Now, two big takeaway messages. Um, one, you can see that exterior and interior sites are pretty mixed. So there's actually not a whole lot of difference between the urban edge and the interior of the preserve in community composition. But you can see the secondary variables mapped on um, correlate really well. These are correlations with precipitation and temperature. So it's not the edge versus the interior that's driving the differences in arthropod community composition. It's really relationships with climate, things like precipitation and temperature that are driving our, our arthropod community composition. So hopefully I can wrap up here in a, in a minute. Uh, so ground dwelling arthropods, again, similar between exterior and interior sites, the, the composition is, but there are some important differences of turnover. Um, there are some species replacements. Um, and this kind of contradicts uh, work from other regions and in other communities that show 
that the urban edge is impactful to arthropod communities. So that's interesting. Maybe um, uh, here uh, in my second point, climate, especially precipitation, is linked to the arthropod community dynamics. So maybe precipitation is just the overriding factor, and it's such a strong factor that um, the urban edge isn't as impactful. And with that, I just want to acknowledge um, a whole bunch of people and many citizen scientists um, that helped with this project. And um, I think with that, uh, I'll, I'll end the, the presentation. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you so much. We are running a little bit behind time, unfortunately. You know, the best laid plans never quite work out thanks to our virtual world. Um, so again, I encourage you to put questions in the chat and we will address those during the break or afterwards as we have time. We have just one more presentation to get through before our break. We are going to run into our break just a little bit. I apologize to all of you, but we'll make sure that we get to that. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Helen again, as well as Dan Gruber. I already introduced Helen. Um, Dan, many of you know, he's been a steward since 2003, and he's kind of the incentive behind the Parsons Field Institute, and he's the one who pushed to make it a reality. He's still heavily engaged in the strategy that we have and plays a huge role in the Conservancy's education efforts. And Dan remains very involved in a lot of the projects that we have, including our IUCN work. Take it away. All right, hi again. So uh, I'm excited to present uh, with Dan Gruber uh, some of our work with the IUCN. So I'll start by giving an overview. Oops. Um, There we go. Uh, about what uh, is IUCN? The mission for IUCN is to, to influence, encourage, and assist societies to conserve the integrity and diversity of nature and ensure any use of natural resources is equitable and ecologically sustainable. Essentially protecting nature, uh, but also in the context of our society. It was founded in 1948 and it is the world's largest global environmental organization. It partners with uh, thousands of organizations across the world, such as uh, the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. Uh, it also has an observer status at the United Nations General Assembly and so helps to uh, guide policy on biodiversity related matters. So uh, it has many programs. Uh, one is the green list of protected and conserved areas. There's the red list of ecosystems. There's key biodiversity areas. And there's one, the, the red list of species, which is the most uh, well-known program of IUCN and the one under which our program lies. Uh, there's also new programs coming out uh, on restoration and conservation. Um, our I, IUCN success story, there are many IUCN success stories. So the way that uh, the red list works is uh, it has assesses extinction risk across species, helping to catch I, um, species of concern and then planning and implementing conservation strategies to protect these species shown here and also species like these. So you might wonder um, why did the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy uh, begin the Sonoran Desert Plant Specialist Group? And the reason is so that we can help to uh, assess the plant species of the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. We already had a flora list of these species, but we had a hard time understanding their conservation status and what we should be doing about them. 
And so through using these as assessment tools, we can start to understand uh, our species in their regional and global context and understand uh, which ones um, may be uh, um, threatened. And so, and from there, um, and also working with the almost 4,000 species across the Sonoran Desert, we can move into planning and acting um, on conservation planning. The way the Red List assessment works um, is it uses a globally used standard for assessing threats and species level probability of extinction to categorize each species into one of these threatened categories, which you'll note includes uh, these least concern category, which would mean is obviously you're not concerned, it's widespread and doesn't have population declines. And also data deficient species that need um, more uh, information about their populations. And so here's how it works. We have uh, to the left here, these are the data field fields that we need to fill out and uh, to draft the assessment. That information, uh, we then use the criteria. There's five criteria, which I referred to before, and each of those have numerical thresholds that help us put these into categories. So our targets um, as the Sonoran Desert Plant Species Specialist Group is vetting the Sonoran Desert Plant List which is nearly 4,000 species. And that has been done for all the species taxonomically. And we, right now we're not at our target, but we hope to eventually, once we have all, all our planning in place to be able to hit 250 to 500 assessments per year. And then once we start understanding which species are in need of um, conservation planning, starting to get into that realm. Also our invasive species survey and removal work that we do um, ties into it. Um, and also we can work with partners for in situ or actually ex situ conservation. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dan for a little bit. Thanks Helen, hello everybody. Um, as you may have gathered from the earlier slides, the IUCN assessments are very detailed and very thorough. Uh, and this is a very ambitious effort involving a number of parties. Um, a lot of the foundational work um, has been done by the Parsons Field Institute and the Citizen Science Program. Um, you can see all the, um, all the different steps we've been engaged in, including providing support and training for um, multiple uh, classes now of um, NAU students who are working with Helen to uh, also do uh, some of the work. Uh, they are in fact uh, developing a threats map and um, beginning to draft assessments. And all of the statistics that are being developed and all of the uh, maps and the preliminary assessments will then be provided to a, an expert panel who will do the final uh, detailed evaluation. Next slide. Um, this work has been going on for a while uh, and much of the basic work, um, I'm pleased to say, uh, has been done or is at least underway. And um, one of the things that we're proud of is the fact that in doing the work, we've also been developing and documenting protocols and training material that um, not only will we be able to use uh, as we go through the species, but we're hopeful that other uh, specialist groups uh, working in arid lands also will be able to make use of. Uh, another way that um, uh, we at the Conservancy are trying to contribute to the broader regional efforts in this regard. Next slide. So um, a lot of work's already been done, uh, as Helen said, to confirm which plants are native to the Sonoran Desert, 
to develop the threats map and to begin to conduct the preliminary assessments. Um, this is going to be a big job. Uh, as Helen mentioned, uh, there are about 3,600 species of Sonoran Desert plants. Um, we've started with the Fabaceae um, with 322 species. And after doing um, um, a, lot, a lot of preliminary work, uh, there are now 87 Fabaceae species that remain that are undergoing um, the beginning of this detailed assessment process. So that's where we are uh, right now. Thanks, Helen. So going back to um, to the yellow um, portion of things, um, the drafting assessments of extinction risk, uh, we need to gather all these uh, information that I referred to before, including the distribution map, which is what the um, stewards uh, are working on, and major threats, which the students are um, we're tasked with uh, finding that information from scientific literature and other sort of gray literature out there. Um, but they, it's, it's really uh, one of the most difficult things to find and pieces of information to find and maybe arguably one of the mo most important uh, ones to find. And so that uh, motivated me to start developing this threats map that Dan referred to. And so we have been, wor I've been working with students for the past year uh, to develop this and uh, recently held a workshop uh, with experts to gain some review, an external review board. And um, so you'll see right here, just a, a picture of it. Um, but it currently has layers of uh, urbanization, mining, uh, some power facilities, transmission lines, roads. So many different threats that are on the ground, uh, spatial and mappable. Um, we are missing some layers, uh, particularly in Mexico, and so that will be the next step in this project. But this will be hugely uh, helpful for uh, looking at threats for all of our species, especially when you have a rare species that doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, has a small distribution and has a difficult, um, you can look at that, the different populations and what threats they may be uh, facing. And that's a really important category um, of, uh, in the, the five categories that I showed you to look at whether it belongs in a threatened category or not. And so our next steps are that we hope to dive into the preserved flora and assess uh, all of our, our spe plant species on the preserve. And that we hope will um, start moving us, um, you know, as we get, get species that are, have some threats, uh, we'll be moving into the planning and acting. And um, in terms of uh, during that assessment process, uh, we can start initial uh, conservation planning by using their IUCN uh, buckets approach where we can think about what are common uh, threats uh, for threatened species or do they have, are they co-located in some locations where they can have added protections? Um, or maybe they they defy sort of categories and they, they need uh, individual species, uh, single species recovery planning. Um, and then there's also when species get to a certain point um, and almost or uh, extinct, then you really, or endangered, you wanna think about ex situ conservation management. And uh, did we leave time for questions, Tiffany? Well, officially you still have a couple of minutes left. We are into our break time. So I leave that up to participants. Uh, you are welcome to stick around and ask questions of these folks or of the other presenters um, or go take some time to break. But either way, please be back by three o'clock so that we can start the second segment.
So we did get one note on this presentation. It says that the IUCN work is a huge worthy undertaking. And I thoroughly agree. Thank you. So while we're on break, if we still have Debbie here, you got a couple of additional questions in case you're interested in responding to those. Well, I'm still here. Okay. Um, so one of the questions we got is where do the bats go in the off season? We don't know. We have, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't know where the bats go in the off season. We don't know where they go to hibernate. We, we don't have tracking devices on them, so we really don't know where they go. They go south to a warmer climate. <laughs> <laughs> they go to such they go to some cave to hibernate. <laughs> so then the other question that we got is do we know anything about bats that might use the preserve other than the ones that are at the mine that we're researching? Um, well, we there hasn't been a lot of studies being done on bats and the preserve, but we do know there was a pilot study done by a student, a master's degree student, uh, Jesse Dwyer, a couple of years ago, and she put acoustic monitors in the gooseneck area, or uh, for those that don't know the preserve, uh, this corridor between, very thin corridor between the northern south of, the northern part of the preserve and the southern part of the preserve. So she did a study, she was doing uh, her, for her research thesis, she was doing the, uh, a study on bats in the Phoenix area, and so she added three acoustic devices in, it was in the summer of 2019, recorded for 14 days, and she uh, found there are actually 24 to 20, 23 to 24 species found in the Phoenix area, and she found 12 in her research species that are using, that, that were using that part of the preserve at least. What they were using it for is a, a different question. It would be you... it would be interesting to see uh, if they do that same research in a couple of years after all the urbanization is in taking that area. Place. Yeah, we will be putting one of our uh, acoustic devices will be put in that area, one of the five that we'll be doing. But we will not be out recording data for fourteen days, probably seven. But it would be very interesting, you're right. Tiffany, do you are you aware of any other research that's been done? We we mm -hmm. tried there was what we tried to do mist netting in one area and got rained out. So we don't have that. So that's the only one I know of. Yeah, in the preserve, I'm not aware of anything else that's been done. There's a lot of work that's been done around the preserve. Um, but, right, Rio yeah. Verde for sure. Yeah. Any Thanks. other questions for anyone? Thanks, Helen and Debbie and Tiffany. Thank you. I'll see you at three. All right, gang. Promptly at three o'clock, we're going to get started. Thanks so much, everyone. And I'm going to mute everyone again. Sorry about that. Mary, again, you need to unmute yourself. Um, but we're going to get those rolling again. And to start us off, I wanted to introduce Mary Fess DG, who is the Parsons Field Institute lead. She joined our staff in 2019 and has just been going crazy since then. Um, through her, we've really been able to expand our regional efforts, further our engagement with the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance and with our other regional partners. And John gave a really introduction of her during his presentation. So I'm just gonna stop talking and let her take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed learning more about our long-term monitoring projects, and I hope that you enjoy learning more about the projects that fall more primarily under our second two priorities, um, where we're going to focus more this afternoon talking about improving management practices. And so let's see if I can click here. As a refresher, our research priorities are to, uh, well, we've we looked at our first one already. Um, and our second two are focused on improving best management practices and then taking that information and implementing it. 
And so our priorities are obviously focused on arid land. And one of the reasons for that is that we are located in the Sonoran Desert and care about this particular ecosystem. But arid lands are critically important, not just in Arizona, but around the world. So dry lands comprise about 40% of the world's land surface. And they also support over 35% of the world's human population. And I should also note that a lot of the people who live in arid regions are also living in developing countries. Um, and so, you know, uh, dry lands can kind of get the reputation for being barren, but as we know here in the Sonoran Desert, they are incredible ecosystems and they support abundant wildlife. You'll also note that our focus is on land management, restoration, and conservation in the Sonoran Desert and arid lands. And one of the critical reasons for this is that natural arid lands are facing many pressures. So we can see these pressures all around us in the Sonoran uh, Desert and especially in the Phoenix Valley where we have one of the largest and fastest growing populations uh, in the country. Uh, and so some of these pressures include development, food production and land degradation. And to compound this, this issue uh, is exacerbated by climate change. It adds a layer of complexity to the issues and much of our work is designed to address conservation issues given this complicated picture. So while pressures are increasingly threatening arid lands, restoration as the answer can actually be very challenging because of the fact that arid lands are water limited, that we have droughts here, and that there is actually less scientific information to draw on for answers. And so the preserve comes in as a very important model site. Um, we are really serving to address these important conservation uh, issues and, through our priorities and our projects that you'll learn about today will cover a lot of work that we've done in the preserve and in the region. Um, but we conduct much of our work in partnership with the city of Scottsdale um, and on the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. And this site is really valuable to us because we can study past degradation and now protected areas. We can also look at continued use, especially recreational use by people. And we can look at other urban and natural pressures like what you saw this morning with the Arthropod Project, for instance. And so all of that can provide data-driven recommendations. So we have two major uh, project areas that fall within priority one and, or two and three, and these are non-native plant control and restoration of degraded lands. So I'll quickly just go through why non-native plant control is a big issue. And later on uh, this afternoon, you'll hear from Paul about our specific experiments to control two invasive grass species. So this is an example of how non-native plants can spread quickly and they can really impact the local ecosystem. So the graphic here shows the rapid spread of a perennial grass species called buffalo grass. Um, many of you might be familiar with this grass. Um, it's not native to the Sonoran Desert and we consider it invasive because over this a very short time span, uh, it can come in and really take over. Uh, that graphic also, by the way, was not in the preserve, but it was in the Sonoran Desert. And so here's an illustration of why buffalo grass and other non-natives are an issue. For one, these species fill in natural open spaces. And you'll see here that when over time you start to have the gaps between native plants filled in and then replaced by invasive species. One of the major issues with this is that that then increases fuel load on the land, making hotter and more frequent fires a major concern for the desert. It also displaces native plants, alters wildlife habitat, and it's difficult to control. But we are fighting the good fight here with our amazing Corps of Steward, Stewards and in partnership with other conservation organizations in the valley. Um, these invasive species often spread um, and they're very widespread and in remote locations. They can regrow from their roots and it requires multiple years of effort to go back on a consistent basis, treat and retreat these species. 
So what are we doing to combat invasives? You'll learn a little bit more about that today, but we have a huge amount of projects going on and we hope you'll learn even more over time. We're mapping, we are controlling populations, we're researching best treatment options, we're collaborating and we're educating the public on this issue. Um, another main focus for us is restoration of degraded lands. We focus on this issue not to put things back to the way they were before they were degraded, uh, but rather to combat habitat degradation and fragmentation because we, we know that habitat loss is a major concern for the globe right now. And what we really need to do is improve ecosystem functioning and then increase the native plant and animal diversity. So we have to take into account the complex challenges of degradation and we have to adapt to them and try to improve the ecosystem functioning. Uh, some examples of areas that we have restoration projects include old roads, widening trails, and other uses. Uh, just like we have challenges with the non-native plants, uh, restoration projects ha also have their challenges, especially in arid systems. We're often looking at huge areas that are difficult to identify and prioritize. There's logistical constraints and natural barriers. So what we're doing, uh, you'll learn a lot about these uh, restoration projects this afternoon. We're mapping sites, we're researching best treatment options, and we're planning and implementing conservation pr uh, practices. And for our presentations this afternoon, we'll start off by learning more about our non-native plant experiments. Then we'll learn a little bit about how we're dealing with that, those issues of identifying and prioritizing restoration sites. And then we'll move into a lot of other uh, restoration projects that will be covered in one longer presentation by Debbie and Jane. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy our presentations uh, this afternoon. All right, fantastic. Thanks so much, Mary. And so now we're gonna move into those presentations, starting with non-native plants, which will be delivered by Paul Staker, a man who truly needs no introduction, but for those of you who don't know him, he's been a steward with us since 2010, and he's really been a driving force within the Conservancy, even serving as our interim executive director for nine months and serving on our board of directors. Uh, he served as the Citizen Science Program Chair for a couple of years, just ending that term this past March. And he's been engaged in a number of our projects, but non-native plants, well, eradicating non-native plants really steals his heart. So that's what he is going to talk to us about today. Are people seeing my screen? We are seeing a weird version of your screen that includes uh, Windows Explorer. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm not on my normal computer, so I will do my best. It looks like it's just showing a preview of the screen instead of the actual screen. Yeah, Paul, you need to actually open. Right, you got it. I'm on now, I think. People seeing the screen? Yeah, maximize it, Paul. It's working on it. Okay, um, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, as Mary mentioned, uh, my presentation will be focused on the experiments that we have been conducting to determine optimal treatments for getting rid of our two non-native grasses, two non-native bunch grasses in the preserve. Uh, I wanna thank Helen and Tiffany for their assistance with uh, the work that we've uh, done that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, I apologize. Paul, what happens if you click that button um, down by the Zoom slider? I'm not sure why it's not starting the presentation for you. Oh, technology. Tiffany, is it easier if you do the slideshow and Paul just tells you when to move to the next? 
happy to do that. Let me get it loaded up on my screen. I apologize, everybody. I've had some internet problems today and uh, I'm not on my normal computer. We will get it figured out. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else is having internet issues, but Cox really had it out for us today. But thankfully, we found workarounds for all of that. Oh, did you train uh, down here on the bottom, uh, lower right, there's that looks like a screen. Did you train click on that? Yeah, we'll do this side. Let me share mine. The only downside is if I'm sharing mine, I won't be able to monitor questions in the chat. So Helen or Mary, if you can help out with that. I'll help out with that. Thank you. Oh goodness, now I have too many windows open. And then there you go. And is it sharing the correct screen? I believe it is. Excellent. You Thank go you. to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, um, Mary explained the key reasons that non-native plants are a concern, uh, and therefore the objectives of the experimental studies that we are going to be talking about today is to determine uh, the most efficient, effective control measures for buffalo grass and fountain grass that best protect the native plant community over the long term. Moving ahead. Just a little more background on the two non-native bunch grasses that we have in the preserve. First, buffalo grass, which was reduced, introduced to the area as cattle feed and for erosion control. Uh, it can be found almost anywhere in the preserve although our largest populations seem to be concentrated on south facing hillsides. Buffalo grass features an underground root structure called rhizomes. Fountain grass is an ornamental grass that has been used commonly in landscaping. It like buffalo grass is now on the Arizona noxious weed list, meaning it should not be sold commercially anymore. Fountain grass benefits from some additional soil moisture so it is commonly found in the preserve in washes, particularly in the steeper slopes of the McDowell Mountains. In developing the study, we identify two locations in the preserve where we have significant populations of each of these grasses. Brown's Ranch in the case of buffalo grass, Sports Wash in the case of fountain grass. In each case, we identified several alternative treatments that we wanted to compare, eight for buffalo grass and six for fountain grass. In order to reduce the potential random impact of natural factors on results in any one plot, we created multiple plots or replicates for each treatment. Each plot is a five by five meter square. This slide shows the different treatment options that were identified for each of the grasses. Six treatments were used for both buffalo grass and fountain grass. First, we included both an uninfested control plot and an infested control plot to determine what might have happened naturally without any treatment. Who knows, maybe the grass in the infested control plot would miraculously disappear all by itself. We had a pull plot where we did a physical removal of the plants by digging it out with a pick. The other three treatments all featured herbicide application. For this purpose, we used a mix of 3% glyphosate diluted with water. We included a cut and herbicide plot where we first cut the grass down to its base with a weed whacker, waiting for the base to begin to green up again and then applied herbicide. One rationale for this treatment was that the herbicide might be more effective if it could penetrate more easily to the root system of the plant. And we had read that the effort required by the grass to produce new shoots might make the herbicide more effective. And finally, we had two treatment alternatives where we relied exclusively on herbicide, either applying it once per year or alternatively twice per year after both the summer and winter rains. For buffalo grass, we added two more treatments since our background literature review suggested it might be more difficult to eliminate the fountain grass than fountain grass. We added a pole and herbicide treatment where we would go back and spray any new growth that appeared after we had first pulled out the main plant. And we added a third herbicide only treatment 
where we would spray three or more times per year, basically trying to spray it every time it greened up. This slide provides a quick visual of the three main treatment techniques, pulling using picks, cutting using a weed whacker, and spraying herbicide. The study focused on four key parameters, effectiveness in eliminating the non-native and reducing any regrowth, the costs of the treatment, the time to complete the treatment, and the effect on the native plant community. For purposes of this presentation, I will combine the cost and time elements since they are co closely correlated. The protocol that we have used in the study to determine the impact of the alternative treatments on the plant community, both native and non-native, was to complete a survey every spring. In each square plot, we run five transects along its length with 20 point intercepts along each transect. This results in a hundred spots within each plot where we identify the plant or plants at each spot, gathering data for every one of them every year. In order to make sure that we don't miss any plants in the plot by our selection of the hundred points, we also do a survey of the entire plot to identify the total number of species in it. The next few slides provide an overview of the results that we have seen to date. This first slide shows the impact that we have seen from each treatment in effectively reducing the amount of the non-native fountain grass in this case. In this case, we are measuring the percent of living fountain grass cover in each case. Going across the bottom, you see a comparison of the different treatments that were studied on a year by year basis. As you can see, each series of plots started in essentially the same spot in, in 2018 before any treatments were done with about 50% coverage in every plot. As we look at the future years, we clearly see there was no miracle that got rid of the grass in the invested control plots as they stayed the, approximately the same level in 2019 and 2020. However, all four treatments had a significant impact after one sequence. Although it ranged from the herbicide two times, which basically eliminated all in the first year, to the pole where there was about four to 5% that remained or regrew. By the second year, 2020, we had elimin eliminated almost all the grass in all of the treatment plots. It's important to note one additional action that we took after the 2020 plant surveys. We had observed that the infested control plots that were still full of fountain grass were still generating lots of seed every year. We became concerned that the seed was potentially spreading to our treated plots and impacting the data. So we decided to remove it by a combination of pole and herbicide treatments. The next chart shows the comparative costs of the alternative treatments across the years. The total cost includes both labor and supplies. Even though we generally have used steward volunteers as our labor force, we have calculated an, an imputed cost for this component using a standard hourly rate. Once again, the six treatments are shown across the bottom of the chart. As the previous chart showed, most of the work was done in the first year as the number of plants to be treated declined significantly in the following three years. So the cost also was concentrated in year one or 2018. Comparing the total cost of each treatment across all four years, the highest cost was in the cut and herbicide plots. We found that using a weed whacker was very difficult in rocky terrain and we used quite a bit of plastic spring as it continually broke on the rocks. Herbicide application and physical removal were more comparable as the cost of the herbicide supplies offset the higher labor costs associated with the more time consuming physical effort of pulling. The final chart relates to the, related to fountain grass measures the impact of each treatment on the native plant community. It portrays the living native plant cover by year in treatment. The first thing you probably are observing is that the number of species is, is much higher in 2019 and 2020 
than in 2018 or 2021. Why is this? Rain, Mary had already talked about that, but we had two relatively wet years in between two years during which we had little rain. These two pictures were taken during our Browns Mountain plant surveys in two different years in roughly the same location at roughly the same time of year, but you can see the significant dif difference in the vitality of the plant community during those two years. So the single biggest determinant of native plant cover seems to be weather rather than anything we accomplish with our treatments. But what else can we see in this chart? Overall, the bars for the different plot treatments seem to largely go up and down together. The one treatment that was statistically lower in the number of plant species in 2019 was the uninfested control plots. Mountain grass is a large plant and it remained dominant in these plots, possibly resulting in fewer native plants being able to germinate. But we believe that the most important observation is that the concern that we would see any potentially negative impact on native plants from our treatments, either an effect from the herbicide chemicals or from physical disturbance caused by pulling is not evident at all in these results. Now let's look at the results from our treatments on buffalo grass with a focus on the differences from our fountain grass results. The effectiveness chart looks significantly different. If you remember the fountain grass results, we reduced the amount of fountain grass by over 90% with all treatments after one year and almost completely after two years. On the other hand, this chart shows that there was still a significant amount of buffalo grass after the first application of many of the treatments and still some left after two years. Only in 20, 2021 does it appear that we've been fairly successful in all cases and we have some concern that the lack of rain may have provided some assistance in that. A comparison of the treatment shows that pulling buffalo grass is the least effective treatment. At best, it will probably take a couple of years to get rid of a large population using pulling. Herbicide is more effective and the best results come from multiple applications as two times a year seems to be better than the one-time treatments and three or more times is even better. Why is buffalo grass more difficult to eliminate? The best answer is it is likely due to the underground rhizome root structure of this grass which is difficult to completely remove physically and which requires multiple herbicide applications to fully penetrate. The cost chart shows some interesting results as well, but it's easiest to focus on the four-year total cost chart. So if we can move to that. Cutting herbicide remains expensive as a result of the weed whacking issues noted previously, but pulling can be almost as expensive over time just because of the time required to physically pull all the plants. Cheap volunteer labor is one thing, but paying for this work is likely to add up. Multiple herbicide treatments obviously add some additional costs due to multiple project setups and chemical supplies, but overall is still fairly cost effective. Although I don't have the time to get into too much detail, I'm still on the previous slide, Tiffany. Although I don't have the time to get into too much detail in this presentation, I should note that the cost comparison is more sophisticated than the summary shown here. For small areas with limited, limited buffalo grass populations, our analysis suggests that pulling may actually be less expensive than herbicide application because of the time associated with setting up the herbicide project, including donning personal protective equipment and mixing the chemicals. However, as the size of the effort increases and the time and cost required to set up the project, is spread over the increased project scope, herbicide becomes more cost effective. Let me move on to the next one now. The living native plant cover chart again shows that the treatments, including multiple herbicide treatments or extensive physical pulling, did not seem to negatively impact the native population in the buffalo grass environments as well. The lower number of native plants that we saw in the infested control plots for fountain grass is not as evident for buffalo grass potentially because these are smaller plants, so the crowding out impact is less. On this slide, we've added a breakdown per, be, between perennial and annual plants. And it is interesting to note that the weather impact we discussed earlier 
is largely, largely related to the annuals, which were definitely impacted much more significantly than the perennials by the amount of rain we had each year. We observed almost no annuals at all in the two dry years. So what's next with these experimental studies? We have not made a final decision, but we are considering stopping the annual plant surveys in the fountain grass studies. As we've noted, we have seen success with multiple treatments to the point where we feel we have largely eliminated the population in the areas of the study. On the other hand, we believe that we should continue the buffalo grass studies for at least another year or two. We also plan to continue to analyze the data that we've already gathered, particularly related to gathering a better understanding of the effects of the different treatments on the plant community. So we may be back with more to report in future years. Overall, we believe that we've shown that fountain grass responds well to both herbicide application and physical removal. Buffalo grass populations can also be reduced significantly, although its rapid growth from its rhizome root structure slows down the process significantly. This has required repeated treatments, increasing the overall cost associated with the effort. Although I've discussed in detail the measured effects of the treatments on the native plant community, there are other potential ecosystem impacts that may be important that were not part of our study. We know that pulling the plants causes significant ground disturbance, and of course it removes, it, removes the cover previously provided by the grasses. Herbicide application does not immediately reduce the fire risk as the grass is left to die in its current location. Fortunately, our studies have indicated that this material does deteriorate over time and it's possible that the herbicide chemicals may accumulate and have a negative impact on certain animals. One outside study, study that we've investigated has suggested that this is the case for burrowing owls. Overall, the current consensus is that some form of treatment to control the non-native grasses is necessary to benefit both native plants and animals, but choosing the correct treatment and management practice can minimize effects on the ecosystem. Finally, we want to conclude with a few thoughts about the management implications of our studies and the impact that they have had on our activities in the preserve. We obviously hope that by gaining a better understanding of the options to control the non-native non -native grasses, the better the results of our activities will be. First, we have focused more of our efforts on herbicide application, given its apparent ability to have a more immediate impact on the invasives and the reduction in physical effort required. We now have six conservancy stewards who have received state certification as herbicide applicators, and they are actively involved in projects targeted at the most significant non-native grass populations in the preserve. We still use physical removal at times, but generally on smaller populations or on monitoring areas that have previously been treated chemically, where the logistics may not warrant carrying herbicide supplies and donning the necessary PPE. Speaking of monitoring, the studies have reinforced our understanding that a one-time treatment will generally not be sufficient to eliminate these grasses. It's critical re to return to the same location for one or more additional treatments to feel confident that the, that the desired result has been achieved. Our goal is to monitor every site where we have performed prior treatments every year until we believe the population is under control. We believe that the knowledge we have gained from both the experimental studies I've discussed today and the actual treatment projects that we have done in the preserve have greatly increased our understanding of optimal management practices for controlling these two non-native grasses. We're eager to share our results with other organizations who may benefit from the knowledge that we have gained. Thanks to any of you who have joined us today who have helped with the effort. Both our plant surveys and our treatment efforts take quite a bit of support and we couldn't have done it without you. And thanks to all the rest of you for joining us today to learn about the studies. I believe that I probably still have a couple minutes to answer questions. Mary, you're on mute. Thanks. I said thanks, Paul. That was really great. <laughs> and uh, we do have a couple questions here. So um, it looks like John took a stab at this one, but I'll, uh, I'll let you answer it as well. Will we have to continue the herbicide on an ongoing basis to prevent the grasses from reestablishing? Well, as I mentioned at the end, we do believe that particularly in the case of buffalo grass, the answer is probably yes. 
uh, that that will be necessary. Uh, in the case of fountain grass, what we're often doing based on the fact that we think that the herbicide is generally fairly effective in the first year, uh, we're often going back and we are monitoring, but we're awful, often just uh, carrying a pick with us and doing those as physical removal projects. So it depends on the situation and how much we've seen in year one that determines what we're gonna be doing in future years. Right. Um, is there a contact to report or restrict the retail sales of fountain grass? Uh, we can take that information. There, as far as I know, there has not been a real central effort to uh, try to deal with that situation. The nurseries should have received information that they should not be selling it anymore, but I suspect that some of them are. Uh, if you can send that information to us, we will try to deal with it as effectively as possible, but it may require additional outside help as well. Um, and one last question here, any recommendations for stink net removal? Stink net removal, well, the, I, much of it is has been done by hand. Uh, certainly small populations can be done to remove stink net by hand. Uh, it becomes fairly laborious if you have a large area. We did do some experiments this year, unfortunately, or fortunately, but we didn't have much stink net because we didn't have much rain. So we weren't able to utilize it extensively, uh, but we did do some experiments with herbicide and did determine that it appears to be effective. Uh, so we're gonna be continuing those efforts more in the future and we may be able to report more on that as we do more of it. This is Patty. I was wondering, is there still a um, trade out with, uh, I know our condominium complex down there has some uh, fountain grass and- We did, we did, Patty, we did a project a couple of years ago where we were trying to do a native plant swap. Uh, Scottsdale Community College was working with us on that and they did uh, grow some native grasses that could be substituted for the non-natives. Uh, with COVID, we've had to suspend that effort, uh, but it may be something we look at continuing in the future, uh, maybe with some variation from what we did back at that time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's another question here. What type of, oop, okay. What type of herbicide did you try on stink knot? Uh, I tried, uh, Glyphosate Roundup, but usually with some type of additive. Uh, it has a little harder shell to it. Uh, so there are other products. Uh, Roundup Plus uh, will do it. Uh, there's a product called Ortho Ground Clear that you can find commercially uh, that has some additional additives in it. Uh, both of those seem to be fairly effective. Paul, this is Bill Bernard. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of fountain grass along the streets of both uh, Scottsdale and Fountain Hills. Much of it has been plotted. Is anything being done with the cities to remove that or to get it treated? It's a great question, Bill. I am not sure what their current initiatives are. I have seen a couple of places where they've done some work uh, as much as I, I actually believe much of that is due to trying to create some fire break along some of the roads. Uh, but that at least gets rid of some of it. Um, I am not current on what their plans are to try to get rid of it. All right, uh, we are going to move along, but as always, feel free to continue putting questions in the chat and we can hopefully address them afterwards. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. That was a great presentation. Uh, so now we are going to move along and start talking about some restoration work. Uh, we're going to start it off with Dan and Mary, who are going to be discussing the degraded lands mapping technique that we came up with. And I've already introduced both of them. I could sing their praises for longer, but for time, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Tiffany. Am I, I'm not on mute, right? Let's see. You're okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so Dan and I are excited to share with you this project. Uh, this is a methodology that we've been developing that uses citizen scientists, it uses Google Earth and other remote satellite imagery to identify degraded uh, areas in the Sonoran Desert 
Um, the example in this presentation is the preserve, uh, but we have moved on to apply this methodology to uh, two of the uh, regional parks. And so both Dan and uh, Helen developed this method and I've been working closely with them on this project since I began uh, my journey with the conservatory. So uh, as an introduction, we've learned a lot about restoration and why we want to restore lands. I kind of think of a degraded site as a piece of property that's like on low battery. So it's a, an area that can't really, um, it, it can't really hold the same amount of, uh, of, of rich habitat uh, value because it's missing so many different pieces. So what we want to do is we want to kind of bring that battery back up because habitat degradation is one of the primary causes of species extinctions and loss of biodiversity. So habitat loss, fragmentation, as well as degradation are really important issues for us to address. Uh, but as we've learned both from the introduction um, in my presentation and then in Paul's presentation, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to work on these types of projects and there's a lot of management constraints. So these barriers include things like lack of time and resources. We're working on very large landscapes. And often if you're looking for small degraded sites or degraded sites within a large area of land, it's very difficult to do from the ground. And to compound that, there's few systematic uh, reviews and tools available, public guidance to help land managers identify these degraded sites in these large landscapes um, at a specific point in time to help us provide that kind of uh, management to prioritize where we're going to work on restoration projects. And so, you know, right here, we have nearly 3 million acres of protected land. How do you find um, the sites that you want to restore within those areas? Uh, so for our approach, um, we have the citizen science restoration scanning approach. Um, and as part of that, um, we, we really want this, it's a remote approach and it can be conducted over a relatively short period of time. Um, we use multiple volunteers to do this and it allows managers to undertake uh, landscape level restoration prioritization. Of so the idea is that this is a key tool for priority setting. We want managers to be able to look at the resources we provide from this method so that they can both identify critical habitat sites so that we can bring that from low battery back to high battery. And we want to provide key tools so that they can use that for restoration planning. So information on what native plants are typically in those areas, what soil type is typically on those degraded sites, and other important information like distance from trailhead to get there to do some restoration work and other factors related to that. So Dan's gonna walk us through what our method is, what the, uh, what the citizen science restoration approach does. Thanks, Mary. Um, as Mary said, uh, we developed this approach to try to address the issues that we're facing land managers in trying to deal with this problem. And so we focused on using publicly available or common resources and processes and things that could be done quickly and with volunteers to identify relatively small degraded areas within very large landscapes. The approach has four phases. Uh, where the first phase uses volunteer teams and Google Earth to scan a landscape and do a preliminary identification. Then the second phase is a more detailed review of those preliminary results using high resolution aerial photos and GIS software. Third phase is using the GIS software to produce some basic management information that will be helpful in prioritization. And then the fourth phase is uh, addressing and providing some guidance about um, what kind of seed mixes and so forth might be useful for active restoration of degraded sites. Next slide. So um, let's uh, use as our example, the work that we actually did 
uh, uh, mapping degraded sites in the preserve in 2018. Now, of course, you're all aware that the preserve, although protected today, um, was subject to um, decades and in fact, uh, really centuries of previous degradation, including ranching, off-road vehicle use, camping, mining, etc. And today there is continuing use of this resource on all of our hundreds of miles of increasingly well-used trails. Now the city of Scottsdale had noted um, uh, potential restoration sites uh, just from their routine work in the preserve. Uh, they had identified 41 degraded sites that were candidates for restoration. Next slide. We started phase one um, using Google Earth uh, uh, and multiple stewards scanning uh, defined areas within the preserve on Google Earth. The reason that we use Google Earth was first of all, it's free and anybody with an internet connection can use it. Uh, you can create polygons and points and lines on it. The things that you note on Google Earth can be transferred to GIS software. And very interestingly, in urban and near urban areas, the resolution of the satellite imagery provided by Google Earth is really extraordinarily good. It's um, much better than is typically available from free satellite software that you can get from NASA or other government agencies. So Google Earth is a wonderful place to start this process. Um, we divided the preserve into 20 scan areas and each of them was scanned by two volunteers working completely independently, uh, not seeing each other's work. Next page. So we provided uh, training to the volunteer team, including examples of distinguishing natural areas that didn't look great from actual degraded areas. But we did encourage the volunteers, the stewards, to mark areas whenever they were in doubt. We decided that we would much rather have false positives, in other words, sites marked as degraded that really weren't, rather than missing some potential degraded sites. Uh, in the second, uh, the first phase uh, produced 376 potential degraded sites. The second scan transferred all of that information into the GIS software where we were able to use high resolution aerial imagery provided by the city of Scottsdale um, that really can see um, individual uh, plants and rocks down to about four inches in size. Um, and this second round of review process using the high definition uh, aerial photos allowed us to weed out a lot of the potential sites that had been identified. So the second round of review produced 75 sites. Um, and then there was a final round of review uh, with staff uh, that came up with 67 potential restoration areas, all of which were new to the city of Scottsdale. In other words, they had not been previously identified. Next. The third phase involved taking those 67 sites and developing some information that land managers, city of Scottsdale in this case, could use to set priorities for approaching restoration. Things like how big is the degraded area? Uh, how far is that area from the nearest access point, such as a trailhead or a trail or a service road? And finally, uh, what kind of um, uh, uh, degraded area is it? Is it an area, for example, that's still being used? Is it an area like a trail junction that's going to get bigger over time? Is it an old mining site and things like that? Next. And the fourth phase was um, trying to provide custom recommendations. Now, some sites can be restored passively simply by preventing further disturbance and let nature take its course. But other sites are so badly degraded 
that they need active restoration, including seeding. And it can be really difficult to figure out what's the right mix of seeds to use in a particular area. So um, the method takes advantage of USDA publicly available information called the Web Soil Survey that basically provides a list of plants that you would expect to grow naturally in each area. We put that layer of, uh, of different soil types onto the map and then we customize the uh, plant list based on um, uh, our flora survey of the preserve and other sources. Next. The result was a map um, which uh, uh, located the 67 new sites and gave characteristics of each of them. And these 67 sites ranged in size from about 50 square meters, not very big, up to more than 10,000 square meters, which is very big. Um, and the total was 10 and a half hectares, which is about 26 acres of uh, degraded sites. Next. Right, so- Mary, back um, to you. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. So we used this methodology remotely and we knew that this process was cost effective. We were using free tools and, um, and having many hands make light work of the scanning process. So we knew it was useful to identify degraded sites, but we wanted to verify our results and compare those remote results to what we would find in the field. So we, uh, in the fall of 2020, trained stewards to visit a subset of the 67 sites. Um, and so we visited 22 of the degraded sites that were uh, found remotely. And we went about verifying the remote, uh, the remote process by looking at uh, the area on the ground. We estimated the percent of uh, plant cover that we were finding, um, but we made sure that we weren't including things on the ground that you wouldn't be able to see from satellite. And we also uh, compared the description of disturbance type and we took some photos as we were out there. So we compared those estimates and the cause of disturbance and our result ended up being uh, really positive for our remote process. So we found that all of the sites that we visited were in fact degraded. So there was no false positives. Um, and we also found that the remotely sensed approach provided a better perspective of both the scale of the disturbance and the type of the disturbance. And you can kind of imagine that if you're on the ground, it might be difficult to see the entire spider trail network that goes through an area, um, rather than if you're looking at it by a satellite, being able to see the entire um, perspective, which really illustrates a distinct benefit of using this remote process um, for discovering and then um, being able to prioritize these degraded sites. And so the management implications for this is that this process has a lot of value. Um, we know that this remote approach is a good way to identify degraded lands. Um, we're very excited that this methodology is providing um, a new tool for land managers. Um, we're able to find small to large degraded sites um, in large landscapes, which could be very challenging. If imagine trying to go into the preserve and map, you know, 30,000 plus acres to on the ground to see what's degraded, it would be very difficult. And so um, a great feature of this is that the scans are performed by citizen scientists with expert review, and we were able to use free information. Um, and so where have we taken this? So we've taken this in a number of directions. Um, we've now had a total of 67,000 uh, acres scanned in the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. And we've moved into the two regional parks listed here where we've also found quite a few number of degraded sites that were previously unidentified by the county. And so uh, what we're doing next is our next steps. Um, we've submitted a manuscript on this methodology to Restoration Ecology, which is in review. And we are working with the city of Scottsdale on a subset of the sites that were identified through this process and also that they have uh, identified as places for restoration planning. And we will be doing more mapping with the county. And so a huge thanks to all the citizen scientists who helped make this project possible and to the city of Scottsdale and more recently to Maricopa County Parks 
um, for working with us on this as well. Thank you. Awesome. I, just, um, I don't know if we have time for questions because I heard the, the timer. <laughs> We've got time for maybe one. I haven't seen any pop into the chat. Okay, so we got a question that says, how well would this process work as a monitoring tool to track changes and disturbances? Yeah, it's a really great point. Um, we were we definitely addressed that in our methods paper where we were saying, you know, if you looked at these same areas over time, um, you could try to monitor what's happening to the land uh, remotely. Uh, but there are a couple factors that would have to come into play. You would have to have updated imagery um, and good quality imagery. So we would be, that would be a limiting factor, would be what imagery would be available. All right, fantastic. Um, again, if people have additional questions, feel free to pop them in there and we can address those at the end. But now we are going to move on to our last presentation about these projects. And I'm going to turn it over to Debbie Langenfeld, who I've already introduced, and Jane Brady. Um, quick introduction for Jane. She has been a steward since 2015, and she engages with us in a number of our different citizen science projects. She is always eager to jump in to do whatever is needed to make our projects successful. And that includes becoming co-chair of our restoration projects. And so that is what they're going to talk to you about now. All right, can, can you see it? I had a little technical difficulty there. Can you see it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So um, thank you, Tiffany, for that introduction. And as she said, Jane and I are the citizen science leads for the restoration project. And we work with Helen, Tiffany, and Mary, and, and Nita and Tamika, our research partner from NAU, on several restoration projects. Hmm. I am having just a little difficulty. Hang on. Hmm. I'm trying to get rid of something on the top of my screen um, that I can't figure out right now. Ah, uh, there we go. Well, Dan and Mary have shown how to find sites that have been damaged. Now let's see if we can help them make an informed decision on how to restore them. Ecological restoration is about helping damaged areas recover to a natural state while improving ecosystem functioning and resilience. Success is largely dependent on the ability to grow native plants, but knowing how to grow them in a controlled environment such as a greenhouse is one thing. Growing them in a natural setting such as the arid southwest is quite a different thing. That's why the word assisting is so important in the definition. To better understand what assisting means, let's take a look at this restoration treatment continuum, starting from passive types of assistance on the left to more active on the right. Habitat modifications include allowing natural recovery, restricting access by putting up signs and fences, Adding materials such as dead branches or con mods to act as nursery plants and modifying the soil by ripping, adding mulch, or digging pits to help moisture retention. Biotic material introduction includes adding topsoil that contains native seeds, spreading seed mixes, introducing biocrust for structure and moisture retention, and transplanting navy plants from surrounding areas. So now that we have a good idea what assisting means, let's take a look at three of the restor restoration projects we've completed and two in progress to evaluate how applying these treatments work. First, let's see what we can learn from a past restoration effort done in 2011 and 2012. As Mary and Dan discussed, the preserve was not always a preserve. For example, there were roads and parking lots in the Tom Thumb area that needed to be restored so they wouldn't continue to be used when the preserve opened. The city and the conservancy used common practices to close and restore these areas. They ripped the soil, added vegetative litter such as dead branches and cactus skeletons, 
distributed seeds, and planted various kinds of cactus. Seven to eight years later, we decided to capitalize on their restoration efforts by following up with the chest to see how well they did. We found the efforts had met success. You can see from the picture that some restoration is occurring, but the plant communities adjacent to the old road have much more vegetation. Seeding was relatively unsuccessful, and while planting cactus did seem to contribute to over a plant cover, it did not appear to aid in the establishment of new plants. The research suggests that to be effective, there might need to be multiple additional treatments of seeding and addition of more litter to help protect the seeds. Now let's take a look at the closed trail restoration project in the northernmost part of the preserve. The city was in the midst of decommissioning some trails, and their common practice was to mechanically rip them with heavy equipment cover them with vegetative litter, and lead them alone to recover naturally. We implemented this project to better compare their common practice with some alternative treatment. Thus began a four-year study to determine best practices for compacted areas. Three treatment techniques were used. We ripped the soil for better water retention using a weasel, salvaged topsoil containing seed banks from under nearby trees, and added seed mixes that Dan alluded to that mirrored the natural vegetation of the, sound, uh, the surrounding landscape. The results of the study were a little surprising. The big excitement is that the use of local seed bank soil was effective and chose promise as a cheap but relatively labor intensive method. I could attest to that. By the end of four years, all plots, including those that didn't receive any treatment, resembled the surrounding natural area. So that tells us that limiting access is one of the most important considerations in restoration efforts. Fewer than half of the seeded species established and persisted over time. And Looking at the graph, we can see that in the first three years, native and non-native cover were both higher in the rip plot. But as conditions changed in 2020, and we've heard that a lot today, and it was a bit drier, unrip was the better treatment for establishing native plants. So in the long run, the unripped won. So these are the two projects that we completed. And as John said, the manuscript for past restoration has been published in American Midland Nation, uh, Naturalist. And the one for old trails submitted to restoration ecology. We're teaming with the US Geological Survey on the Res Restore Man project. As you can see from the map, they're testing restoration treatments in all Northern American, North American deserts across a broad range of landscape, soil, climate conditions, and disturbances. The blue circle shows the location of our research sites. We started field tests in 2019. Our four sites include an area on the preserve at Granite Mountain called the Den, where rock climbers used to hang out and party an area damaged by ATVs and campers at Lake Pleasant, an old farm field at Sutton Community College, and a burned area in Tondra National Forest. There are four distinct treatments being used at each site. Mulch, wire mesh connectivity monitors, AKA pond mods, installed perpendicular to the soil, below ground pits, and warm and cool seed mixes to see which might do better as the environment changes. Since we just started our field test in 2019, it's too early to show publishable results. However, we can say that we're starting to see the cool seed mix plants, lupin, desert marigold, and chia, in the pits doing well. Looking at the visual comparison between spring of 2020 and 2021, I think Paul showed kind of a similar comparison um, at Tonto National Forest. 
it's clear that we saw more growth in 2020 than in 2021, probably due to the effects of the current drought. And one of the treatments on the continuum that has been often overlooked is BioCrest. Our research partner, Anita Antonenka from Northern Arizona University is on a mission to change that. Here she is introducing the project. Hi, I'm Anita Antonenka. I'm a research professor at the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University. My particular research interest is using BioCrest and restoration to restore degraded dry land. It's been my pleasure to have an opportunity to work with the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy to do this groundbreaking research with such an incredible citizen science team. So what is BioCrest? Well, BioCrest in the Southwest is the community of three organisms, lichens, cyanobacteria, and mosses. It's vital to arid environments because of its incredible benefit. The most important is the uh, erosion control. It holds the soil together. Others include nutrition recycling, moisture retention, and an often overlooked one is that it breathes in carbon dioxide and breathes out oxygen. Because of human-driven activities such as urbanization and farming, it is disappearing rapidly. If Anita had her way, we would roll biocrust out across the earth like a carpet. So the goal of this project is to determine the best methods to cultivate biocrust for use in restoration. Because biocrust can take decades to grow, and because we can't just go out and buy some like we can with seeds, we had to develop a way to grow it quickly to use in rehabilitation efforts. We salvaged the biocrust from the preserve before new trailheads were constructed. It was then sieved for homogeneity and grown in several controlled environments, including greenhouse hoop house and covered with shade cloth. Several innovative treatments were then applied to the resulting inoculum for the field research. For example, it was mixed with psyllium to help bind it to the soil, grown on jute, and made into pellets with diatomaceous earth. We installed 222 research pots in the preserve at Granite Mountain and are now in the second year of data collection. Well, let's take a look at some of the results. As you can see from the graph, all treatments have good field establishment and did better than the control. Psyllium worked well to help the crust bind to the soil. The crust grown on the jute prevented non-native plants to the red bone from growing. And we found that we are able to store the crust for later use without degradation, which is good because we have 50 plus five gallon buckets of them and several projects that would like to use it. We're proud that this was the first successful reintroduction of mature biocrust in the Sonoran Desert. So we reviewed the results of four of our restoration projects. What can we tell Dan and Mary to help them return them the best treatments to use to restore the damaged areas they identified? We've shown there are various things to consider when making restoration decisions and how complex it can be. Restricting access will work for recovery over time. Soil modifications do help plants establish, with, but with a caveat that they help non-native plants establish too. Seed banks are low-cost alternatives. Seeding had limited success, and briocrust can be grown quickly and used in restoration efforts. Looking to the future, we're well positioned to continue to contribute to the existing body of knowledge concerning best practice management plans for degraded and damaged land. The research has paved the way for those working on future projects where biocrust might be used to improve environmental and human health. And we have loads of storage left, the preserved storage left that can be used. I want to acknowledge all our partners in citizen science who helped make this research possible and who helped with the uh, salvage of the biocrust. And I also want to especially acknowledge my colleague, Jane Brady, who's been terrific to work with. 
So are there any questions? Thanks so much, Debbie. That was great. And we just got a uh, question that came in. It says, what is locally provided seed bank and where do I get it? Locally provided seed bank is, is uh, seeds that exist kind of in the soil. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we, the seed bank, the soil contains seeds. And so in that case, we dug it up from under some trees that we had. So you can't go out and pursue it. You, um, you have to dig it up and find it somewhere and dig it up. But it's in the soil. I have a question. It's Patty. How long does it take for the bio crust to develop and or grow? So, well, um, 10 to decades, it takes, it can take decades, but 10 to 50 years, it's a long time. So that's why you see, um, you know, when you go to Southern Utah, you see don't bust the crust signs and stuff because it takes so long for it to recover. Still got a few minutes for questions. We're actually ahead of time for once. Okay, well, we are going to go ahead and move along then. Uh, we've got just one more presentation to go. Thank you again, Debbie, and thanks so much to all of the other presenters. Uh, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Well, I could if I could. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, share dis disappeared somewhere. Um, that, there we go. There I go. Okay. All right, so I am going to start sharing my screen and this is going to be the last presentation, but we will have plenty of time afterwards just to chat and answer any additional questions that folks might have. Um, and again, I have too many windows open. Okay, are folks able to see that? Yep, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, so we've given you kind of this whirlwind tour of some of our projects, where we've been, where we are now, but now we want to focus on where are we going. And so I'm going to talk to you about what we're looking towards over the next couple of years. So the goal of our work is not only to influence what happens within McDowell Sonoran Preserve, but also to influence management actions across a much, much broader scale. So what we're learning here in the preserve through, three, through these and our other projects are really helping us better understand the preserve's ecosystem and it's helping driving actions to protect the special place. But our work has implications far beyond the preserve boundaries. And so what we're doing can influence management actions throughout the region and throughout the state, throughout much of the Sonoran Desert. And from there, we're not stopping, we plan to take over the world. But in all actuality, some of the work that we are doing is applicable across arid lands across the entire world. So I'm going to walk you through our future plans for all of these projects, um, taking them at priority by priority. So starting with this first one, which is to assess the impact of the urban stressors and climate change on the resources of the Sonoran Desert. So we are planning to continue all of our long-term monitoring projects into the foreseeable future. Many of these are still in their infancy. We just have a few years of data, maybe three to five years under the belts of many of them. And ideally we need at least five years, preferably a lot longer than that before we're able to really start to assess the trends and the factors that are influencing these resources. But we are starting to analyze these data and our goal is to start summarizing findings for half of these projects each year. So you've already seen some of the results for half of those and we'll be focusing on the other half in future years. Uh, we're really looking forward to digging further into these and starting to suss out some of those trends uh, and determine the management actions. So we are planning to continue these over the long term, which as Helen said, is really crucial for being able to, to detect these changes and to be able to recommend possible management actions in order to protect these resources and the overall ecosystem. As part of this, we are also investigating ways to compare our data with other regional data sets to understand trends and management needs over these larger areas. So as far as we are aware, there are no species that are unique to the preserve, but the preserve does make up a really important part of their range. 
So by tying our data in with similar projects across the region and by collaborating with partners, we have, can have a much better understanding of the big picture and what's needed to protect these important resources throughout their entire range. So as examples of that, for birds, we are currently working with Audubon, uh, with Arizona Game and Fish Department and other partners to determine what data is available, who else out there is conducting these surveys, and what we can do to kind of account for all of the different survey techniques that are involved in birds uh, so that we can actually make good comparisons between these data. For butterflies, uh, as Ron mentioned, we are working on making some comparisons with other counts that are occurring throughout the region and are being reported to the North American Butterfly Association. For our plant and animal phenology work, we are working with the National Phenology Network to determine how our data are already being used in these broader studies, as well as additional comparisons and analyses that can be made. So as an example of this, recently our soap tree yucca data were included in a study at the Hornada Experimental Range in New Mexico, and they were looking to determine the start and end dates of the growing seasons of the yucca. And our yucca data was also used in a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service project called Flowers for Bats, where they're seeking to understand the availability of agave resources for sensitive bat species as they're migrating. Um, and speaking of bats, Debbie gave you a little teaser about this, and I'll discuss it more in a couple of minutes, but we are starting a new project and are going to be tying our data into the North American Bat Monitoring Program. And so with that, I wanted to uh, say that we recently uh, received a Heritage Grant, which is allowing us to start a new project as well as dive further into the bats. And so we're very excited about these projects that we're going to do. The first one is with the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. Uh, this is a sensitive species. It is here in Arizona considered a tier 1A species of greatest conservation need, which means that it has some extra protections here. And it's also being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act at the federal level. Primary threats facing this species include habitat loss and fragmentation, which you've heard a lot about today, as well as disease and removal from the wild. So it's well known that urbanization and development influence the species, they do affect it, but it's really not known in what ways that happens and what the management options are available in order to mitigate that. And so that's the goal of this project. We're hoping to fill in some of those gaps in the knowledge. Um, this is an ideal opportunity to study that, again, with the preserve being a wildland urban interface. We're able to understand how the urbanization, as well as how pressures such as internal recreation could be influencing what the species does. The preserve is also an understudied population. As far as we're aware, there has not been a study on tortoises done in the preserve, and so this is the first that is occurring, and that's going to help better understand not only this population, but also the species overall. So all of this data is going to be kind of working together with the other projects that we have, to better understand the preserve ecosystem. As part of that, better understanding connectivity within the preserve and within the larger landscape. Uh, so looking at how roads, how trails, how other factors might be influencing what tortoises are doing within the preserve and what is needed in order to protect the species as well as the habitats on which they depend. So there's kind of three parts to this project. Uh, the first one is to actually find tortoises out there. So we started that within this past month. Our goal is to put transmitters on 20 animals, which will allow us to locate them again. And they'll also receive GPS transmitters, which will take a location every hour. So if you think about that, 20 animals, getting a location every hour for two years, we are going to have an abundance of information on these animals and it's going to be great. And then one of the big parts of this is outreach and education. We are wanting to help educate people about tortoises, about how important they are, why our work is so important to protect the species, and most importantly, the role that they play in protecting species such as this and in the habitats that they depend on, such as the preserve. So then the second part of our heritage grant uh, is focused on bats, and Debbie gave a really great overview on this. But thanks to the Heritage Grant, we have been able to strengthen our current work and expand. We've been able to purchase our own equipment to continue our emergence counts. Uh, and we also started this new aspect of acoustic monitoring in different areas of the preserve. So this is a great opportunity for regional and continental data comparisons. So we'll be sharing this information with the North American Bat Monitoring Program, which is going to inform understanding of bat occurrence across the entire continent, 
document trends over time, and also determine the management that's needed to protect these species throughout their broader ranges. So moving into our second priority. So again, this is trying to determine effective management practices to be used in arid lands. As you've heard, we are wrapping up a couple of these projects, including the closed trail restoration experiment and our fountain grass control experiment. And so now we are able to start using the knowledge gained from these as we move into the management side of our work. We're also continuing some of our projects. As you heard from Debbie, we've got a lot going on with our soil crust. Uh, we're continuing our storage experiment, trying to determine how storage might influence the viability of these crusts to be reintroduced into the field. And then of course, we're continuing our experiments to actually determine how to reintroduce them into the field and what methods work best. And then as you heard from Paul, we are continuing this buffalo grass control work because it just doesn't want to be tamed. Uh, so we'd like to get another year or two under our belts with this, just so we can help tease out whether it was the drought that really influenced what we saw out there or if our treatments are having a bigger effect. And then we're also expanding some of these projects. So in the restoration world, we are moving into RestoreNet phase two. And so working with our partner at the US Geological Survey, we're determining next steps, which could include potentially sampling the microbial community and the disturbed and undeserved, undisturbed sites, doing some mycorrhizal treatments or seed balls with inoculum to improve seeding uh, and some other things. A postdoc is also working on analyzing the cumulative data across all of the USGS RestoreNet sites, including the four that we oversee, which is really exciting. We're also looking at potential options for using the successful treatments that we have seen from our other projects and combining those to see what works best out there in the field. Uh, so things such as the surface modifications, using those seed bank soils, seeding with the species that actually germinated in our plots, and we actually just submitted a grant which would give us a leg up and allow us to accomplish that. And then we're also doing a lot more with the invasive annual plant control. And as we heard from Paul, he's actually been doing some mini experiments out there, uh, doing a lot of research, background research on potential control options. And then he's been doing these mini experiments and he's been seeing a lot of positive results, which is really great. So finally, moving into that last priority. And again, this is kind of the culmination of the first two, taking the knowledge that we gain from those first two priorities and then actually putting them into action. So you heard from Paul that we are using the results from our non-native plant experiments and now applying those on the ground here in the preserve, as well as sharing that information so that can be used elsewhere. And that includes looking at the different size of the infestation as well as the different species. We're also using our degraded lands mapping results uh, to prioritize restoration sites in the preserve. And we're now working with the cities to start implementing large scale restoration practices at these sites. And then also with IUCN, we're still working on those individual plant species assessments. But as those wrap up, we're going to be moving into the conservation planning side of that to inform management across the Sonoran Desert. As all of this, we are continuing to strengthen as well as expand our partnerships. I'm just gonna quickly run through these. Uh, we are involved in a few different initiatives with the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance, including the two shown here. The Invasive Species Working Group has a goal of identifying areas where we can better collaborate. And that includes between governments and municipalities, nonprofits, land managers, and more. And so we're planning to put together a draft strategy by the fall that includes how to make tools for this more accessible to others. And then after that, the working group will morph into something more action oriented to get partners and sectors more engaged in non-native plant control. Desert Defenders is a group within CASCA that focuses on engaging people and removing non-native plants. And so we're continuing to engage new partners and individuals as part of that. And we're also looking to expand that through iNaturalist or some other platforms that will allow more people to get involved without having to go through uh, intensive in-person training as part of that. Sticking with the non-native plant theme, we just started an exciting new partnership with Intel. Uh, somebody actually posed a question in the chat about this. So Intel is investigating high, using high resolution imagery from drones in order to survey some of the more difficult to access areas of the preserve for non-native plants. And so that would greatly improve our efficiency as well as the safety of people working out there in the field. We also started a recent partnership with the City of Scottsdale Firewise program. 
The Scottsdale Fire Department has long recognized the risk from invasive plants and recognizes that a concerted effort with communities, HOAs, and other organizations is really needed in order to tackle that. And so the, through the FireWise program, they're providing broad support and encouragement to HOAs and homeowners to become FireWise and to defend their home and their communities against wildfire. And so we're really excited to be part of that and to be able to provide some on the ground support for those efforts. As I've discussed, we are working on these regional flora and fauna analyses. And so we're trying to identify others in the region conducting this work so that we can assess regional trends and work together to maximize our impact. And then finally, we just started a brand new partnership with the River of Time Museum in Fountain Hills. It's an information sharing partnership. We are helping them redesign some of their exhibits at the museum, and they're helping get the word out about who we are and opportunities to engage with us as well. So then last but not least, I want to mention communication because this is one of the most important things that we can do. Uh, we don't wanna gather all of this information and just sit on it. Instead, it's really important that we get it out there. And this goes back to our field institute mission, and that is to inform natural resource management, to contribute knowledge to the scientific community, and to inspire people to be stewards of the land. So the first step in that is to share our data and our findings with land managers. That includes the city of Scottsdale so they can best manage the preserve, but also managers of the other arid lands that they can best understand and protect those precious resources as well. As part of that uh, goal of informing understanding and management. We feed our data into these larger databases, uh, including the regional, national, and global, which helps inform understanding at much, much larger scales than what we can accomplish on our own. And then we're also interested in getting this information out just there to the scientific community. And we do that through collaborations, through publications that you've heard about, reports, presentations, events such as this, and so on and so forth. We're also sharing some of our raw data as appropriate to provide comprehensive analyses and better inform understanding and management. And this is a great opportunity to start some two-way dialogues and establish new partnerships as well. But then I think most importantly is get, getting this information out there to the public uh, because they are the ones who are the ones who need to know this information because they are the ones who make the biggest difference out there. So within the citizen science uh, program, we recently created a communications team which is helping us get the word out about our work, both within the Conservancy to our other volunteers, as well as more broadly to the public. We're also working on redesigning our website to provide more information about our projects and what people can do to help. And we're also working with our education staff, stewards and partners to weave our findings and our methods into our educational offerings, all the way from the youth who come out and participate in our annual Expedition, Expedition Days event, uh, up through our natural history courses and other education offerings that we provide to adults. So the goal is really to raise awareness of what we are doing, but much more importantly, raise awareness of the important role that everybody has to play in this work and what they can do to help protect these places and these resources that we all love. So with that, I'm going to wrap up with this slide and encourage you to learn more and get involved. There's lots of ways to stay informed about the work that we're doing, uh, including a couple of different newsletters. We have a Conservancy-wide newsletter. You can sign up for that on our website. We also have a citizen science newsletter in case you're interested in monthly information about what we are doing. Contact me if you'd like to get uh, information about that. Also, please check out our website. We've got a science blog on our website and a lot of other other information. I encourage you to volunteer with us, whether you're a steward, whether you're a partner, whether you're somebody who has never heard of us before and this is your first interaction, come out and get involved with us. Uh, you can contact me if you want to get involved in any of our projects or more, learn more about Yeah, I can't speak anymore. Learn more about them. Um, if you want to take it a step further, I encourage you to become a steward. We are planning to restart our Stewardship 101 classes this fall and those will be offered monthly. There's information and the application on the website. I will note if you are a steward and you want to get more involved in any of these projects, go into Better Impact and you can check the interest box or you can contact me or the project lead for these. And then finally, we are always interested in finding new partners and new collaborators. So if you are interested in collaborating, sharing information, helping us communicate the importance of this work, uh, please contact me. We would love to learn more from you and partner with you. 
And with that, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so much to all of our amazing presenters. We're really excited about everything that we've accomplished, but we're even more excited about where we're going with this. And we're really excited to have all of you along for the ride on that. And so with that, we're going to wrap up. I encourage you continue putting questions in the chat, or honestly, I've listened to myself way too much. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself as well. We would love to hear your voices. And I'm going to stop sharing. And thank you all so much. And a lot of chats have come in. Okay. <laughs> Let me do a quick look through here. A lot of uh, great information about the presentations. I do want to note uh, this is being recorded, so we will be putting this up on our website, uh, likely chopping it into little pieces, each of the different presentations, so you can easily find the information that you want. We can also make the presentations available via PDF so that you have copies of the slides. All right, going back to some of the questions that we have received. Um, so go, we got a couple of questions about degraded lands mapping. So I'm gonna call on Mary and Dan and put them on the spot again. Um, so we got a question, would the degraded lands mapping be a good candidate for AI training uh, for a neural network? Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, Nothing with AI is easy. Um, the biggest uh, uh, issue in general facing um, uh, trying to apply AI to um, uh, these kinds of problems is you have to have an enormous amount of uh, what are, what's called training data so that the AI software can learn in effect how to identify the right stuff and not identify the wrong stuff. So we would have to um, uh, basically collect imagery of uh, all kinds of degraded areas and uh, not degraded areas that could be mistakenly called degraded. Um, we would need uh, tens, ideally tens of thousands of them to train AI software to distinguish between them. Now, someday, if we keep on doing this work or other people um, adopt this method and do the work, I suppose it might be possible to collect, you know, that amount of um, uh, screenshots and, uh, and such from Google Earth and or aerial photography and eventually use that to train AI software. Um, but I suspect we're a ways off from being able to do that. Great. We also got another question about degraded lands mapping. Can this method with high resolution imagery be used to monitor non-native plants? And so that's one that we are starting to investigate using drones with Intel. But Dan, I don't know if you want to provide any further information. I know you've done a lot of research on that. Yeah, um, I actually answered uh, the person who asked the question uh, directly. The, um, right now, the answer is no. Um, and it's uh, for several reasons. First of all, the resolution um, still isn't good enough, um, uh, not from Google Earth and generally not even from uh, aerial photography. Uh, but uh, um, as you just said, Tiffany, we're exploring the use of drones because we can get much better resolution um, from drone-based uh, photography um, than we can from uh, airplane-based aerial photography. The other issue, with using this method for non-native plants is that typically uh, there, there are two ways to identify non-native plants. One is uh, the fact that it greens up faster than native plants do after heavy rain, but that means having um, photographs uh, or you know imagery either from Google Earth or from aerial photography that was taken at just the right time to catch that early green up of the non-native plants and that's almost impossible to you know, bring about. I mean, you, you, you know, Google Earth is opportunistic and uh, aerial photography is done on a city schedule, not on the plants schedule. So that's one issue. The second issue is in order to be able to distinguish things, non-native plants from natives visually by just looking at them, again, you'd need much higher resolution than we can get today. The, the drone imagery probably is good enough resolution 
to actually do straight visual identification of non-natives versus natives. And by the way, the emphasis of that project is to collect enough um, uh, uh, test data um, uh, uh, to feed AI software to actually do the, um, the imagery review and identification. And Dan, wouldn't that, the drone approach would be much more targeted because as Paul mentioned, we, we have a pretty good idea that fountain grass grows in washes and buffalo grass, grass grows in south sides. So we could be more targeted with drones as well. Right, absolutely. Well, one of the, one of the advantages of the degraded lands mapping methodology that Mary and I showed you is that it can cover a large area very efficiently. Uh, obviously, drones can't do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you said, you can only use it, you, you would want to use a drone after you've done some sort of preliminary identification, whether that's you just walked along the trails and you saw stuff or, you know, however you did it, then you'd send the drone in to do the more detailed work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there was another question that was asked about uh, soil crust, which Anita answered within the chat. I encourage folks to go back and take a look at that because it's a great question and then a really great answer. Thank you to everyone for your thanks in the chat. <laughs> um, this is really great. Um, Paul, we got one that I am going to throw at you. Uh, it says that there was no mention of red brome grass or wildfire mediation. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Right. Uh, red brome is clearly a uh, non-native that's of great concern. Uh, it, like the uh, non-native bunch grasses, is certainly a fire hazard. There's good reason to believe it's contributed to some of the recent significant fires in the area. Uh, red brome, unfortunately, as we know, is well widespread everywhere. It has become very invasive and, and has taken over large areas of the preserve as well as outside the preserve. So the question is more of a logistics issue of how can you attack something that has spread so, so extensively already. Uh, we are already starting to do some work to try to see if we can, at least in small areas, uh, figure out a way to address the red brome uh, I'm working, uh, I know Don Pike uh, from the Friends of Tonto was on this call today. Uh, they have a uh, grant from the Tonto National Forest to do some work to investigate at least creating fire breaks with, uh, for the red brome. Uh, and that may be all that's possible to be done. But if we can figure out some way to control it, at least in some, some limited areas, uh, it may go a long way toward helping to address the area, but it's probably too late uh, to do anything to address it on a full scale basis. And Anita actually responded to that as well and said that they have some proposals out there to test some methods to create weed barrier fire breaks with biocrust sods. So that'd be great. Mm -hmm. All right, any further questions? You guys are taking it easy on us. All right, well, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit just in case people do have any additional questions or again, if you just wanna unmute yourselves and chat, I miss all of you. So it'd be great to chat with you. But thank you all so much. It was wonderful to see you and we hope to see you out there in the field with us. Thank you everybody for tuning in. It was a great crowd. Thank you. Thanks everybody for all your work on this and thanks for participating. <laughs>